Hello, everybody. I am Brother Luke. Welcome to this fun Fellowship Friday night for the Church of the Eternally Secure. I see that uh, the chat room looks like it's raring to go. Hello, everybody. I've been looking at some of your comments in the chat room, and it looks like you're ready to have some fun tonight, and I feel the same way. And I have a wonderful surprise for everybody. In case you're not aware of it, um, tonight, Sister Renee has been able to, in, in spite of her busy, uh, tiring schedule that she, she has, it's, she's joined us here tonight. So I'm very thankful that uh, she can be part of the program tonight. And uh, I'm expecting uh, Angel. Uh, she hasn't uh, contacted me otherwise. Uh, and um, you got a message from uh, Sister Lisa, didn't you, Ben? What, what was that? Yes, uh, Lisa said that uh, she won't be able to join tonight, but she will be listening and possibly even participating in chat. So looking forward to that. All right, fantastic. Okay, uh, all right, Ben, while well, I've got your uh, attention here, why don't you say hello to the congregation? Hey, everyone. Sounds like everyone is looking forward to some good fellowship tonight. Um, I think we all could use it. It's been a busy week for me, and it sounds like after looking through chat, everyone's kind of had a been a hectic week so it'll be good to kind of wind down and start the weekend the extended weekend off right so all right thank you brother and uh you know if you could uh, if i try to look at the chat room too much i get distracted and uh, don't do the other things i need to do so if you could kind of pay attention to what's going there ben i'd appreciate that and keep keep us informed uh sure. Sister renee i don't know if you're back yet uh, did you get your post your link and you ready okay Want to say hi to everybody? Hey guys, good to see you. I'm not here that often on Fridays because we have a live stream Thursday and Friday. <clears throat> so I'm usually hanging out with my son Friday, but he's buried in his laptop, so he doesn't even seem to know I'm missing. So I think we'll be, <laughs> I think we'll be fine. Hi Jonathan, he, uh, my son loves Jonathan. He's a mathematician in the chat room, so my son was happy to, to see him. We hadn't heard from him in a long time. So I'm looking forward to tonight, you guys. Yeah, Jonathan Bowers, huh? yeah, that's right. He's quite, a, he's quite the math wizard, isn't he? Yes, he is. Yeah. Uh, all right, well, let me, uh, while I'm thinking of it, here's, here's some amazing grace for everybody. I hope everybody is full of grace. All right. Uh, all right, I guess um, there's nothing else that needs to be uh, done. So why don't we go ahead and post the first uh, true-false statement, brother? Okay, here we go. True or false, there will be a need for bathrooms on the new earth. <laughs> oh, man. Well, um, Sister Renee, why don't you go first on that one? Well, here we go. Look, uh, the, the need for nutrition and food is because we're mortal. So we need food as an energy source and we expel what we don't need. In our glorified bodies, eating is only for pleasure. There's no uh, uh, need for it. It doesn't sustain life. Jesus is our life. We're in a glorified body. But we see in his glorified body, he sat down and ate breakfast. You know, he, he had the fish on the, the beach when the guys were out in the boat uh, and they had breakfast on the beach. So we know it's more of a fellowship and joy, joyful event. It's for pleasure. Uh, and not for necessity. So absolutely not. That will not be necessary. Yeah, that's um, we've had a lot of um, interesting questions, to say the least, over the years on Sunday and also on Friday nights. Uh, that one's really uh, I, I, I never expected to get that one. However, we, we did discuss that when we did my series on heaven, 50 hours in heaven. Uh, discussing what life is going to be like in eternity. Um, brother, but before I comment, Brother Ben, let me get your answer to the question. Uh, I actually put uh, leading false. Um, I have, uh, I don't really have a, a good, strong uh, idea of why. It, obviously, I, I agree, agree we eat. Um, and uh, But I, again, do we need to process it? Does it really provide any nutrition? Uh, like uh, Renee gave a very satisfying answer I, um, that it's more for pleasure. Um, because I think, for example, uh, that talks about the, the, the tree, uh, giving bearing fruit 
uh, 12 times a year or 12 different fruits, fruits throughout the year for the healing of the nations. And I wonder if that's more like, um, like, I, I, I kind of wonder what that was about. Like, uh, is it more like a, like a caffeine type of thing? Like, you know, where it's, it's uh, just kind of gives you a boost or is it something that, um, is it something that, uh, that, that actually does heal you. Like for Christ, for example, when Christ appeared to the disciples, they he they could feel his see the the holes in his hands or wrists uh, that that hold his side. And so maybe if you know when he eats from the tree of life or uh, that that or that tree that has twelve different fruit for the healing, maybe they that those heal those wounds. Um, not that they hurt in, in any sense, but just restores them. I don't know. Pure speculation. Um, but I also know too that you know I doubt there'd be any human waste in in the new earth. I think it's going to be completely undefiled. In fact, even the sea that won't exist because the kind of the sea is a picture of uh, chaos and sin um, and kind of just uh, the unruly forces of nature. Um, so, I, yes, I would say I would definitely be leading false on that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Uh, leaning false, huh? Uh, I answered it certainly false. And the reason I felt I could answer certainly is because it says there will be no need for bathrooms. So I think I'm quite confident in saying there will be no need, but maybe there will be bathrooms. Uh, maybe we will be doing that, doing that kind of a bodily function. I kind of doubt all that uh, for all the reasons that have already been stated by uh, Renee and, and Ben, but uh, this is makes reminds me of a time I was street preaching and a Muslim came up to me and was arguing about Jesus is not God. And one of the arguments he he gave me, it was really quite a uh, surprise to me. He was really adamant and really even angry that, that, that he, are you saying that Jesus and he, he the, what the language he used is more um, was crude. But he's saying that Jesus would actually have a bowel movement, that God would have a bowel movement. And for that reason, he has to reject that Jesus is God for that reason. <laughs> so, but of course, he didn't understand. few centuries as they were trying to define all these terms and concepts about the, the Godhead. Um, and they, they developed all these creeds to express it. Um, they, that's what they came up with, the hypostatic union. Jesus is fully God and yet fully man at the same time. So in that way, of course, uh, Jesus and may, maybe us in eternity, I don't know. This is, this is uh, when Jesus had his incarnation is his we're not talking about res the resurrected Jesus. Um, now, re Jesus in the resurrection, there, there are references of him eating and drinking, um, but whether he had the to, had the need to for, for that uh, to actually uh, have that bodily function, um, I, I don't think he had, had the need at that time. But there's nothing in the scripture. There's there's so much in this that's not in the scriptures, and I, I have to just caution everybody. Um, it's, it's interesting to talk about and it's fair and, and um, to uh, guess and try to try to figure it out together. But I would really encourage everybody to be very careful. If something is not clearly stated, let's not let's not get, get too confident in our in what we're we say. Yeah, I wanted to remind everyone, you know, the Muslims, they use that same argument for him not being God, but they don't understand he preexisted and then humbled himself, humbled himself in the form of a man as a servant uh, to be obedient, even into the humiliating death on the cross, because only God was sinless and could be the lamb of God. And only man could pay for man's sin. So he had to be both. And it's just silly to limit God 
and say that he can't manifest in any form he wants to. Why is it impossible for them to believe that God can come in the form of a man if he wants to? You know, they limit him when they do that. It actually limits God. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what I told him also in that same conversation with a Muslim, uh, he said, God cannot have a son. And I said, well, um, let me ask you, are, are you are you married and have a family? You have children? He said, yes, I have children. So you have a, you have a son? Yes. So you can have a son, but God cannot have a son. So you can do something God can't do. So uh, that you're greater than God, I, I guess. Now, but it didn't really accomplish anything. Uh, it, this person was really beyond reason. He was really quite emotional and agitated. Um, so a lot of times the best answers we can come up with are, are I'm not saying that I have the best answers, but even if we give someone the best possible answer, um, they have ears, but they don't hear. Um, all right, uh, I see Sister Heather, she wrote, I would say before the cross, probably, but after the cross, probably not. I think the way you, your conclusion and the way expressed it is exactly right, sister. And I see Brother Dave. Uh, um, Brother Dave, by the way, since we, we've got some um, uh, open, open space on the panel tonight, Brother Dave, if you are available and interested, uh, let me know. And, and we'll, we'll send you the link if you decide you'd like to actually uh, join us on the panel. And um, let's see, uh, anything more, uh, Renee or, or Ben? No, you guys gave me great answers. Mm -hmm. Okay. You hear that, Renee? You got the endorsement from Ben. The answer was great. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Well, seriously, I, I had not ever considered that um, that is that eating and drinking was really more for a, a pleasurable uh, fellowship type of experience as opposed to a necessity. Um, that makes perfect sense. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, there is the supper of the Lamb, right? Yeah. Um, Jesus said he looked forward to that Passover dinner his whole life. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so the, the, there it is clearly stated in the scripture there's going to be at least one time that we have this dinner together. And then there's also a reference to the uh, the trees uh, along the, uh, the river that uh, bear different fruit each month. And I, I don't know, I don't think it actually says we're going to eat from the tree, but I think we should, we could assume that safely that they're there for us to eat, but maybe not. Uh, so there are reasons for us to think that we will be eating, but uh, there's also reason for us to think that it's not going to be necessary. I mean, after all, if we have eternal life, if I have eternal life and I don't eat, do I, I can't die, so I don't need to eat to live, do I? All right. Uh, all right, Ben, let's go to the next question. Okay. The next question is true or false. God is good. So there will be no judgment. Oh, wow. What? It, it, God is good, so there will be no judgment? Is that the answer? Yes. That's the question. Yeah, that's the proposition. True or uh, false. True or God. false, right? Oh, God can't be good if there's no judgment. If there's no judgment, then God's not good. So that whole question is is wrong in its statement because it, the statement is god is good so there is no judgment but uh i'm not good if i let somebody do horrible things to my son and not serve justice for it it, it means i don't love my son if i'm not seeking justice for the things wrong to, to him so uh if it's it's a little we need a little more information is there yes there is judgment for the saved and the lost but the saved are not judged to to their destiny saved people are not judged to determine whether they enter heaven or have eternal life the judgment for saved people is determine the things done in the body whether good or bad 
for reward or loss of it based on the service we do for God as his children. Uh, but for the lost, there is a judgment uh, and they will answer for what they've done. Uh, but they will they will be lost. So there will be punishment and justice meet out according to whatever they've done. So um, there needs to be a little more uh, added to that. You know, there, there is judgment uh, by God. And if there wasn't judgment, then he wouldn't be good. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. The, uh, I was talking to someone earlier today on the phone uh, about a, a problem that uh, he was he was unaware that this has become a problem uh, today. Uh, not it's not a brand new concept, but uh, it seems to be emerging uh, and gaining some popularity, and, and that is universalism. And universalism or universal salvation is the belief that uh, everybody is uh, going to have eternal life in, in heaven, everybody. Uh, no one will actually, uh, you know, go into the lake of fire and perish. Um, that's cer certainly provably, uh, provably false uh, in, in, through the scriptures very easily. And so many scriptures say that our, some people will perish, no longer exist, they will be destroyed. Uh, and even if you think that that means uh, eternal torment, uh, that means that there are some people that are not going to have eternal life and in the new heaven, the new earth. So it's clearly proven in the scriptures that universal salvation is false, uh, but people want to believe it. I even had someone tell me, Luke, uh, I'm a hopeful universalist. In other words, I hope it's true. I hope that everybody does end up uh, saved. That, you know, I, I don't see it in the scriptures, but if it's true, I'm happy. I'm, I hope it's true. So it's tempting. It's tempting for everybody to just want to think that, yeah, well, someday God's going to just save everybody. But um, if we are biblical Christians, then we have to conclude, that our, our conclusions have to come from what the Bible says. And to me, this is something that's absolutely clear and explicit. There's, it's not ambiguous at all. But it's tempting to want to believe it, to, to, to think that God would be so merciful that everybody's going to be saved eventually. That's it's really like the concept of purgatory. People don't have to be, be there forever. Eventually, everybody's done enough suffering that they, they can end up going to heaven. Uh, but that's this kind of idea that we have here in this question, that um, if God is good, there will be no judgment. That's kind of related to this. If there's no judgment, that means that no one's going to be judged lacking eternal life and second death on the lake of fire is, is, the, is the outcome. Um, so God being good does not mean that he's obligated to give everybody eternal life. Uh, God did more than more than enough by offering everybody eternal life. Um, so, I, I, I mean, the question it makes it makes a person think that in order for God to be good, uh, He would have to do that. But uh, I don't think that they go to those two ideas um, are required to go together. Um, the other point that Renee mentioned that goes along with this is, is justice. See, God has a lot of attributes. Um, we know that God is love. That's probably the first, the greatest attribute because the Bible says God is love. Not that, God, not that God does love, but actually God is love. So, uh, um, and it says God is merciful, God is just, God is righteous, God is, uh, uh, all, all these things that, uh, and then there are, uh, characteristics too that God is omniscient God is omnipresent God is omnipotent so these are the things that uh, we conclude from the Bible and church throughout history has uh, all agreed these are orthodox viewpoints about the identity of, of God and if God is just uh, God could not be just um, uh, if uh, he says that uh, there's a 
um, the sentence is death. If you if you eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the sentence is death. And then yet, if death is not executed, he, he would not be judged. He would be a liar. So, but what he does do is offer everybody a way out by a substitute, a substitutionary death. So he's, he's merciful and gracious in that respect, and yet re remains just. All right. Um, ben, uh, did, you didn't answer the question, did you? Uh, no, not yet. Go ahead. Um, the, oh yeah, I would say yeah, if there's no judgment that God, like you said, God is not just. That's one thing about the Bible that I think a lot of people um, fail to uh, recognize is that in, in every way, uh, God, the Bible is a legal, is a legal framework. It's a legal document. It talks about, you know, I, I even my brother who's a lawyer, both of my brothers who are lawyers do not understand that the Bible is, is a legal framework and, and that uh, justice, perfect justice has to be met. Um, otherwise, it, it's not, uh, God would not be just. In fact, God would be unrighteous if that was the case. So for God to be righteous, he has to be perfect and, and never always be, always make the, the right just uh, sentence. And I kind of see God, for example, uh, it, 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 you know, kind of like a, a, you know, a circle. And, and in that circle, you see all the fruits of the Holy Spirit. All of that is God. It's perfect. It's holy. Um, and that outside, outside of that, you might see like a secondary ring uh, that would be the, the, the angels who haven't fall, fallen. Um, and so they're innocent. They're not righteous, but they're innocent. And then outside of that is the law. God's law protects any anything from unrighteous from coming in uh, to his little inner circle. And that's where the law defines. So anything outside or the, out of that protective layer of the law is, um, is, is, uh, you know, declared or titled with, with, you know, adulterer, uh, ungodly, unrighteous sinners, uh, liars, thieves, all that, all those kind of things. And that's the fruit of the flesh. That's why, because we were not born in that inner, inner circle. That's why we, we exhibit all those manifestations of sin. That's why we need to be born again inside of that circle, uh, and inside of that perfect righteousness. Um, and also too, like that, like I mentioned, that outer circle kind of being a picture of the law. Well, I, th I don't think it's, I think, uh, one thing that's interesting is that you know Satan was a covering cherub, and he was uh, he was uh, outfitted with all kinds of precious jewels, just like the high priest was in the Old Testament. Again, uh, not being righteous, but it, it, those jewels on the ephod uh, protected uh, the Holy Spirit. That it's a picture of what's inside the person, um, and then also too the New Jerusalem, I believe, it also has all kinds of jewels on the outside of it. So the law is good, but Anything, anything that's outside of that that perfect relationship with God, the the the, the law, even though it's good, um, it only uh, makes that person uh, condemned and weak, essentially. So, um, yeah, if there's no judgment. If, you know, if I if I allowed my kids, or you know, if I allowed or didn't want justice for someone who you know did something wrong to my children, for example, that would not be. I it would, it would only reveal that I don't love. I don't really truly love them. So. Um, God's perfectly justice. That's why Christ had to die so that all that judges could be fulfilled 100% and then mercy now is available. So uh, I, I totally agree that uh, God is perfectly just. Amen. Thank you. Uh, I see Sister Angels here. Hello, Sister. Hey, guys. I'm sorry. I scared you. Now, I, I Joel is, I guess he's now the boss. We're not sure. His boss quit after like 25 years, uh, kind of suddenly. So he's uh, having, he's, he's at work all the time. And he got called in and uh, I, I, I came here as soon as I could, as soon as I, as soon as um, I was uh, able to, to break away and uh, set everybody down, but I had to wait on him for groceries. Uh, so that's, that's how we're pretty disorganized here. So uh, he oftentimes brings home the food to cook. <laughs> so okay. I have to wait for him for dinner, but, I am really excited about the questions because I got to see them ahead of time. So, uh, which is, which is really cool. Um, and uh, I was thinking that, you know, obviously, yes, God is good, but th there has to be a judgment because uh, obviously for everything, for all the reasons everybody else has stated so far, but if you think about it, I don't know, maybe this is just me, but if there was no judgment, 
and there were there were no stakes involved. All and all of this really at the end of the at the end of the day, God was just gonna magic everything all better. And, and nothing really had um, permanent consequences. Um, nobody was um, like everybody. Everybody ended up just being on all the same category, and God just wiped it. Made everything make made everything good for all of eternity uh, for everybody. No matter what we did in life, it would. Um, in my, it, it would, I would feel it would rob us of of something I think is important. To God that we have, which is sort of the idea of, of the self, and that our, our experience here is real, that our experience as 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 the person that He created us um, as is actually real. It amounts to something. Um, it, it it's the uh, the other half of the relationship with God. Uh, it, it it's not all just um, the same, no matter what you do. Uh, it, if you think about it, since God created everything, and He's the beginning and the end. If, if uh, all the stuff that he told, tells us in his word um, and, you know, the, uh, the high stakes, uh, uh, not really, it's not really a game, but the high stakes we're operating in here, trying to give people the gospel um, and, and sh you know, share the good news of what, of what Christ did. They have a ticket uh, onto the, on the lifeboat, so to speak. Um, and we have this urgency with which we approach that mission. It, it, it all really just came sort of like a, I don't know, like sort of extra spiritual event. Um, it would feel to me it was first sort of faux drama. God was acting out, uh, and that it was you know that we're all just players on the stage, and none of it was actually real. Does that make sense to anybody? Like I'm trying to put into words you know, something, a different perspective than what other people have already shared, because I, I think that, um, you know, I'm trying to figure out what it is, as somebody who was an unbeliever and who is actually very afraid of this idea of spending eternity with God, uh, and I still get, like, weirded out when I think about the fact that he made all that there is, and he is, is the answer to every question, um, and, you know, the Alpha and the Omega, you know, it's it's easy for when I'm dealing with unbelievers, you know, people that are especially people that are like scoffers, uh, like myself, like a like an atheist type person or agnostic. They um, they always ask me why did God do any of that? Why do we even have to believe? Why did God allow us to fall? But they they act like He could have just done anything, and so why did He choose to do that? Did Christ have to die? Because I was that way too. I just didn't understand why Christ had to die. I thought that because God was making it, calling all the shots, anyway, it was, um, you know, like it was like this big game he was playing. And people approach it that way a lot. And they, you know, and, and even like the way the Calvinists look at things kind of comes into it because they look at, you know, they say, they say ultimately we don't have any free will. And in a way it's almost like we don't have any true self because we're just sort of little robots that we can't, you know, um, we can't help but do what God, you know, uh, already uh, planned for us to do. There's, there's no actual, like, there's no individuality. There's no, um, and ultimately with the Calvinists, there's no point to anything anyway. There's not even really a point to preaching the gospel because uh, those who will be saved will be saved. And um, those who can't be saved, they, you know, they can't believe anyway. So it all just kind of, it's all sort of like a, a snake eating its own tail. And to me, that that the same thing happens if God, if God just uh, saves everybody in the end, even though He put us through all of this and all of this worrying of, uh, you know, about those who are going to be lost and and believing that we were actually, um, you know, uh, helping Him bring people into the kingdom, and that you know it wasn't just a little like you know when your kids are little and they want chores to do, but they're really not big enough to do chores, so you give them like a bunch of little silly errands to run to occupy their time. Like that's what it would feel like to me if, if it was all for not in the end, as much as I would also love it. If there was no such thing as if the person was lost forever, there was no such thing as perishing. There's no, no such thing as, um, anybody because God was going to fix it all in the end. And you know, who knows, maybe he could do that. And maybe there's just some big reveal that, uh, that we're all, you know, we're totally ignorant of right now. We're all make sense. But in terms of what, you know, what his word says and the God that I understand to be, it, it, you know, that would make, that would render everything kind of meaningless. 
and it would actually kind of make it add to the questions that a lot of atheists will ask me as to like why they should even be grateful in this for them when it was all his fault anyway. He didn't even, you know, we didn't ask them to, you know, whether they wanted to be created and um, and he could have he could have done any number of, you know, of things, you know, it you know, to make it to where nobody had to be lost and, and all that. Like they act like um they act like they don't see the meaning. They don't see the point. They don't see the poignancy of what, you know, of the, of the love letter that is the Bible and the plan of salvation to this creation. Like what what I believe God is trying to do is trying to earn our trust. I, I don't believe that, um, you know, we have to earn his approval. I believe that all, that all of this plays out so that we can honestly say that we chose to love and worship God. That it's a it's a mutual relationship. There's something that you know. It, it's not just that he created these little puppets to, to worship him forever, and you know and that it was all just gonna you know end up that way in the end anyway. And that you know we're, we're really just uh, like a vanity project he created to have somebody around to worship him forever. No, it's a real relationship. But it, without the stakes, it, it somehow takes away from the, the the gravity of that relationship and and what God did for us and. Um, we, we bond through that, I feel, in, in a weird way. I feel like we bond with each other and we bond with God. Uh, even, you know, prior to spending eternity with him, seeing him face to face, we bond with him uh, through this um, this experience of trying to, to save people from the fire. Uh, so, you know, uh, it, it, would, it would kind of melt by everything. If you said, just kidding, you know. <laughs> I don't know if that made any sense to anybody, but it's really hard to put into words what I'm trying to say here. Um, uh, I've thought, you know, thought about it a lot, but I've never really talked about it. Uh, yeah, I, I totally agree. I mean, like you said, the stakes have to be high because, as Jesus said, um, he who is forgiven much loves much. And uh, I believe for good to be manifested, well, then uh, evil, for good to be seen as good, uh, then evil has to exist. And yes. all, everything that God did was to put away evil forever. He, he he condemned it, has a complete plan for it, so it can never, it will never exist again once, once, uh, once the we, we, once the new earth happens. Um, so to me, it's awesome. I mean, he dealt with the problem once and for all, and um, it's yet future. It's, it, it is fulfillment, but um, what a wonderful future um, all of his new creation has. Mm. I would, right. I would say, Sister right. Angel, um, you're um, apologizing for um, your answer, maybe not being so <laughs> clear, but uh, it was clear to me, and I think uh, I appreciate all your thoughts there. Uh, one thing you said, I heard you say this, um, maybe it was um, uh, last night or maybe it was last Saturday or something, one of, one of the recent programs you were on, I heard you say that God is uh, attempting to earn our trust. And you just said it again. Yeah. And, and uh, I find yes. that very interesting. I've never thought of it at all like that before. But I, I you made me think, and uh, you often do. You often come up with something very unique and profound that I hadn't heard before and makes me think. Um, but that could very well be oh. what's what's going on. But what you're trying to do is answer one of what they call the hard questions for Christians. I've got books in my bookshelf. Yeah, it's the title of the book: Hard Questions for Christians. And um, the, the people who don't believe uh, either in God or Christianity, the, 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 they've got their questions. And and uh, if we're going to be equipped uh, uh, as apologists, ready with an answer. Then we have to do the learn, study to give, be ready with an answer. And some some questions are quite difficult, and the answer is very philosophical. And philo I have a playlist titled "Philosophy: God and the Bible." So if you if your mind works right and you can, uh, um, the, oh, I should check that out. Well, philosophical Philosophy subjects and questions are sure. of interest to you. Uh, for me. I find it fascinating, but it's also like the concept of uh, time travel. My mind gets like twisted, and maybe I'm just my intelligence is not quite yes. enough to comprehend certain things. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think you did a very good job. It I mean, also, uh, to me, it's intimidating to try to 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 understand certain things. You know what I mean? Yeah. A little intimidating, like it's too big for me. Mm -hmm. You know. 
Well, but um, but thank you. I, I felt bad because I came in from a screaming toddler uh, nightmare that that was when I was out there until I, I come in here and I, I I you know I sit down and it's all quiet and I'm just trying to gather my thoughts so that I just talk in circles. But but it is the hard question for Christians because it was the question that nobody could answer for me when I was a kid, which was why. Okay, so why do you have to do it that way? Why do you have to do any of this that way? You know, any of the you know why did the plan of salvation have to be this? You know, mm -hmm. and people ask that question. It's kind of like a spoiled little brat asking, you know, something they just don't even understand. Like, you know, they're, they're trying to understand. Well, why do I even have to appreciate that you go to work and pay bills? You know, I didn't ask to be born. It's kind of like that mentality, you know. <laughs> but mm -hmm. all right. Well, thank you, I, um, Renee or Ben. Do you want to say anything more about this question before we, we move on? I think we covered it. I think we covered it really great in a really great way. I mean, these are, I think we answered these questions that like, like uh, Angel said that a lot of Christians can't answer. And I think it, it's uh, very important that we be able to answer these things. Cause if these answers, I think bring, bring faith because they understand, Oh yes, of course it, it makes perfect exactly. sense. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, I also think that, um, uh, there are some people that really have a lot of deep, thoughtful questions, and, and these are uh, objections and uh, reasons they do not come to the faith. And, and until they get satisfactory answers, they won't. But when they do get the answers and they're satisfied and they believe what happens to them, <laughs> oftentimes they become the most uh, dynamic and best um, um, ministers and, and evangelists and, and, and apologists. Uh, they may be prolific at writing books because they've, uh, they've had to get answers to the hardest questions. Right. All right. I guess we'll go to the next question, Ben. What is it? Okay. This one is a little, a lot of strange questions tonight, but they are good. And this one came uh, from uh, someone emailed the church. So, and it is true or false. It's okay to lust after your own spouse. Hmm. Wow. All right. Uh, Renee, is it okay to lust after your own spouse? Is that true? Yes, it is. The marriage bed is undefiled. God gave us those urges. Uh, they are a gift within the bounds of marriage. Luke? All right. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Um, um, yeah. There, there are. Uh, there are sometimes a, there's a very short, truthful, uh, correct answer. Uh, if you think of any more you want to add to it, but let me let me see if uh, uh, Angel, you ready to respond to it? What do you say? Well, I, I you know, first of all, I, I certainly hope so. But if you look at um, like the Song of Solomon, and um, uh, you know, it, it seems pretty obvious that. Uh, uh, well, I don't. Now, I've had this question before too, because I was wondering if lust something that is reserved for some, like an adulterous situation or you know fornication. Like, like is it only lust when it's not your spouse? But no, I think that that's the the, the opposite. Like Renee said, that that the lust is uh, becomes sinful when it's not directed at the uh, at you know at at, at your spouse and, and you know at the marriage bed. Um, and then it's a uh, it's a wonderful uh, blessing. Um, that God gives us, uh, you know, when properly channeled, you know, and, and, uh, and it's actually, it's real sad because uh, for a long time, the world had me convinced that, that, you know, people might call it lust, other people might call it like butterflies or, you know, passion, all of that stuff. I really just believe that, uh, that that was impossible to maintain past, you know, the beginning of a relationship. And, um, it turns out, you know, when you're actually married and you do things God's way, um, and you know, uh, I feel very, also very blessed by God that um, you know He gave me a, a successful, happy, uh, happy marriage. Um, uh, it, it turns out it's actually even less fleeting than when you're, you know, when you're just dating people. I mean, I, I still, I still feel all of those, um, you know, the butterflies, lust, all that stuff for my husband because uh, I, I love and respect him, and I, I do believe that that's uh, how God intended it. So. I would say uh, how the first question was phrased, but mm -hmm. I definitely second Renee on that. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. 
Thank you. Ben, what do you say? Well, I know that the word uh, lust, desire, lust and desire are often, um, oh, actually, uh, lust, desire, and covet, actually, are often uh, interchanged in the Bible, uh, depending on the translation. Uh, but even within a translation, it, they, um, even with the same translation, that the Bible itself often will um, interchange those words within the context. Um, and what's interesting is, uh, again, I'm just thinking, thinking to a thought I had last week, which was uh, I mentioned uh, where uh, when, when Joshua was conquering the land, they were conquering the land. Uh, God told them that there are certain goods from certain lands that could not, they were off limits. So they called it basically an anathema or karem. It was off limits. Um, but uh, uh, Achan uh, took all this uh, shiny Babylonian armor. And when he saw it, there was a formula that they used, that he used, or the Bible used to describe, describe it, in that he first saw it, then he coveted it or desired it, and then he took it. And that's the exact same formula that we see in... Um, in Genesis, where, where the where the temptation of eating of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, Eve saw it, she desired it, and saw that it was good for the for wisdom and becoming a god, and then she took it. Well, um, we know that coveting is is a sin. So even even you know even if you don't, um, you know if you have if you covet something of your neighbors, even if you don't, uh, you know actually go and steal it or uh, take it for your own, it's the the idea of coveting it, wanting something that's not yours. Is um, Being it's a good. sin. It's a sin. However, what's interesting is, in in the garden, um, the only law there was is that you should not eat of it. They didn't say anything about desiring it or coveting. There was only one law. So it, it, that that alone. Um, but there's also other principles of scripture too that the law actually defines what's righteous and unrighteous. So again, Adam and Eve weren't weren't righteous. Otherwise, they would never would have sinned. Would never even have desired it. But the but they were innocent with regards to the law. And so um, they, again, the, the coveting something or uh, desiring it, lusting after something that's not yours uh, or that's, that's off limits to you is, um, is, it, is an, uh, an aspect of sin. But again, with the husband and wife, that's lawfully yours. That, that's with, that, with the legal uh, covenant, essentially, between a man and a woman. And um, I, I don't think, I don't think, God, there's nothing, anything in the Bible that talks about it being uh, un, unrighteous. Uh, in fact, it even says in Genesis after the fall that you would, you will desire your husband, but he will rule over you. That that's not saying it's sinful to desire your husband. It's just that this is the state of affairs now. It's kind of like the the uh, what the what they call the battle of the sexes. The, you know, it's age old battle of of you know woman wanting to control the husband uh, and the husband wanting to control the wife um, and trying to rule over each other essentially. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't. Anything between uh, within a legal framework, again, that's completely lawful in God's eyes. Um, it's it's not defi uh, transgressing any law whatsoever to desire your wife, and so I think it's a gift from God, um, and it's not at all sinful in the least. Hmm. <clears throat> all right. Well, uh, my first thought when I hear the word lust. Uh, I, I get a um, negative connotation in my mind. I think of it in, in a negative sense, lust. Um, so it makes me ask, is it always negative? Is lust always bad? Um, I just asked Google, what's the definition of lust? The first answer I got was very strong sexual desire. And so there's no judgment. Is that is that good or bad? It's there's not there's no judgment uh, put in the definition just a strong sexual desire is lust if if that's the case then uh, applying that definition to uh, a biblical marriage uh, there would be nothing wrong I, I, I you'd say uh, of course it's okay to lust for your spouse I asked look for another definition and it it says um, what is the real meaning of lust it's as a noun, it says intense sexual desire or appetite, uncontrolled or illicit sexual desire or appetite, lecherousness, a passionate or overmastering desire or craving, usually followed by uh, or for a lust for power. Uh, 
So in that definition, they do uh, apply a negative uh, interpretation or in their definition. Uh, so I, I would have to conclude that uh, uh, it can be completely positive. Lusting for your spouse can be completely positive. It's just a great desire. Um, but uh, and then, of course, lust has the potential of being very negative, uh, like, like many things. So even something that's good can be taken to an extreme. Uh, and uh, and now, it, now we've overdone it. That's why I like using that prefix hyper, uh, hyper dispensationalism, hyper preterism, uh, hyper sovereignty. It's, you, you can take something that's a, a valid point and just take it too far, and now you've ruined it. Um, all right. Any more from anyone on this? Well, what, one thing I was going to me mention is uh, when, I, when I was talking about the uh, the law of, defines what's righteous and what's unrighteous, and that's how God can declare declare us righteous is uh, is because uh, there's no law. There's no He took away the law. We, the, the Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. So he took away the law, so there's nothing that can be brought up against us. No charge that can be uh, accused. Uh, Satan accuses the brethren, but uh, he he, do, he doesn't uh, do it lawfully because uh, we're not under the law. And um, so I thought that was interesting. In fact, I, it came to be a couple of weeks ago when I was reading the Count and John, where uh, the prostitute was being stoned, and they said, "Hey, we see her in the very act." And so they, they actually witnessed a, a crowd was against her, and then. There was multiple witnesses there, so we we caught her in the very act, and Christ basically said, "Okay, well, he without sin cast the first stone." And what he did it, it never made sense to me. What like what, what what's the lesson here? Then it occurred to me, ah, he took away the witnesses. It's it's a story I believe to teach that Christ takes away the witness against you, and so he, all those witnesses were there, so they could not lawfully be condemned because they need two or three witnesses. And then Christ said, Christ was there and says, "I neither do I condemn you." because he's the just and the justifier of those who believe in him. And so I, I thought that was incredible. Um, so are we ready for the next question? That was incredible. I, when you told me that, I was just like floored. That, that was such a, yeah, you right. know, it, that really tied it all up for me. Yeah. I, amen. I do. I do think that's an insight that is, uh, I have overlooked uh, all these years. So appreciate you sharing that. Um, all right. Any more from anyone or shall we go on to another question? By the way, Ben, I, I took a, chat, a question out of the chat room. Someone just posted and I, I, I put it here in the a private chat here. Okay. In case, in case you run out of questions, you want to use that one. Okay. Sounds good. All right. What's the next one? Okay. The next question is true or false. The Bible cheat teaches tenses of salvation. Uh, and I could clarify that a little bit more, but I, I kind of want to leave it as is if I can. But if it needs to be clarified, I, I'm happy to do that. This is my question. Yeah. True. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Sister Renee. True. There are tenses of salvation. But I like what Daryl was saying last night. Salvation of our souls is just the beginning of our walk. We were saved. We're being saved right now. And we're going to be saved. Now, that doesn't mean that our eternal destination is not done. It is. We were saved from the penalty of sin, which is death. The wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So we were saved from the penalty of sin. Once we're saved from that, the Holy Spirit dwells in us, and we're being saved from the power of sin in our daily lives, and to grow closer to God. So we're being saved from the destructive force of sin as believers. And we're going to be saved in the future when we get our glorified bodies. The very presence or existence of sin will be, will be have salvation from that. Uh, some people claim to have already been saved from sin perfectly already, but they're just deceived. We can't help them. But once we lose this body and get our glorified body that's the fullness of our salvation that's why uh in scripture it says our salvation is nearer than when we first believed and false teachers will take that and see nobody knows they have eternal life yet you can't know till you're saved so eternal life is something you might get if you live good enough until the very end of your life and that's not what it's saying the salvation meaning 
uh, being rescued, the fullness of our salvation is our new glorified bodies. So Ben's absolutely right. There are different tenses of salvation. The salvation provided from the penalty of sin is already completed. Jesus did all that work on the cross. We've already been saved from the penalty of sin. We have passed from death to life and shall not come into condemnation. That is done. But as long as we're in this flesh, there's a present tense of being saved from the destructive force of sin in our lives. And in the future, we will be saved. Our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. We'll have our glorified bodies. Amen. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, Sister Angel. Well, um, uh, as for uh, my ultimate answer, uh, Renee uh, really covered it perfectly. But I did want to make sure I wasn't getting a trick question because I, I don't believe the actual phrase tense, three tenses of salvation is actually in the, in, in, in the Bible. I wasn't sure if that's what uh, Ben was talking about in terms of the wording of the question. But um, but I'm really going to, I'm going to second uh, what Renee said because it's, uh, uh, I mean, it really the uh, thorough job. I'm curious about if there's a twist to this question, though, because of no, what, uh, what, uh, what Ben said. There is, a, okay. But, um, but, uh, but yeah, uh, I know um, some sticklers might, because I, I believe I've, I've explained this before to uh, Lord Shippers, and they will uh, uh, ask me to uh, show them where the, where the actual phrase is in, in Scripture talks about tenses of salvation. They act like I'm extrapolating something um uh you know uh uh you know unfounded or some some personal interpretation but it's all in the context it's all uh, you know it, it's hard enough with, when you're dealing with one of those people though to to keep them on you know even one point uh because they keep wanting to jump around everything but that is the most uh, one of the most uh, fundamental things to understand uh especially when it comes to the, uh, uh things of salvific nature that uh, so few people understand, and um, it's easy. I mean, I, under, I you know, I can see, I can see why, especially if people are just jumping around to different parts in scripture and not reading it in context. Um, but it, it's just like it, 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 you know, that principle, and then the principle of uh, you know, uh, service versus salvation. Uh, those two things, I think, are are maybe two of the most misunderstood things. Um, when it comes to uh, salvific doctrine, that uh, that if people just understood those two basic things, they'd have a much easier time, and they would come out with a lot less false understanding on the fundamentals. So, Sister Angel, amen yes. to you on that because I hate it when somebody will go show me the verse that says there's three. Yeah. So they want one verse to for to yeah. prove an entire biblical concept. Like yeah, I know. Study the Bible to understand the Trinity, to understand salvation. Oh my gosh. It's not one verse. It's you have to study the entire context to get the concept. You can't you can't go like the Muslims do it. Show me the verse where Jesus says, I am God and don't worship me. <laughs> I mean, it's just like, you know, I gotta show you that verse. I got I gotta show you one exact thing, or you won't believe it when the concept is clear in scripture. You know, right, right, and you can't keep their attention long enough on any one thing to even fully flesh out one concept. Like it's so, it's so difficult. With uh, they do it on purpose. It's they're difficult on purpose <laughs> a lot of times. <laughs> the Trinity is a good example too. Yeah, you're right. That's that's people yeah. like to try to be difficult about that. But it's so clear. I'm sorry. Are you finished? I'm done. Yeah, sorry, I'm done. Yeah. I know that uh, I, I'm in agreement. I say certainly true, but it, I, the, the more I think about this, uh, it brings up more questions in my mind. Um, a matter of fact, I, I took this wrong uh, years ago in a local church I was attending. It was a home church, and the pastor started teaching this concept, and I didn't... I, I'm not sure if he was teaching it the way that uh, we're expressing it now, uh, but the way that he was explaining it, it made me think that he, he didn't think salvation was complete and that we had to keep our fingers crossed, hoping that we're continuing to be saved. And it worried me, and I ended up having to leave the congregation. Uh, but 
I think that's, that's the reason we have to even explain this uh, uh, second point, that we're being saved. Because people will take verses uh, and, and use it to support the, this, well, um, you got to continue uh, in your good works and in your faith, or what you got to, you could lose your salvation under certain circumstances. So uh, uh, that's why you have to continue doing the right things to, to continue being saved. Um, because people are teaching that, there's a need for us to explain what does it mean we are being saved. Otherwise, I don't see any reason to even de deal with it, the concept of being saved. Um, um, now, if, the way that Rene expressed it, I think that's probably right, uh, but uh, being saved from the power of sin, um, I'm not, um, it, maybe you can clarify that for me, but uh, if, if we're being saved from the power of sin, um, on one hand, yeah, uh, we are. The Holy Spirit is there to uh, transform us and renew us, and, and uh, uh, but certainly no person, even Paul confessed that he was not able to uh, uh, get rid of this struggle of sin in his life anyway. I, no matter uh, how great of a Christian you are, some people would say Paul's the greatest Christian or whoever you want to put in that position. Uh, has anybody ever been able to overcome all their sin? And that brings up the problem of Pelagius, Pelagianism, which is one of the earliest heresies, teaching that um, uh, what the grace of God really means is that um, because of God's grace, you have the ability uh, to uh, completely stop sinning and thereby earn your salvation by making yourself acceptable to God. And that's what God's grace is. The most sinister. Helping you. God's gracious enough to help you so that you can overcome sin and therefore make yourself self-righteous. Mm. Uh, so that's where, that's where there's a potential problem with this idea that uh, 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 we're being saved from sin. I, I'd like to think that we're being saved from, from sin, that we, it's power over us. But are we really being saved from the power of sin if we can't completely get sin out of our life? Uh, until the, the resurrection. And now the final point of, of will be saved, um, uh, I guess that would mean that we're being saved from the, the, the second death and mortality uh, because with the, with the glorified eternal body, uh, that's the, uh, the ultimate final death and we're saved from that, if I'm understanding it correctly. But if can I get anybody's feedback on what I just said and see if I'm uh, misunderstanding anything? No, no. Uh, actually, you know, once we're saved, like Daryl was saying, it's the beginning. And so uh, with, with the Holy Spirit in us, it does uh, the process of salvation from things of the world, things that are destructive to us. There, There's some things that I know I was doing that were very dangerous to me, actually, physically. Uh, and so uh, I think I, I get upset when I see like in the King James, it says, but to those who are saved, it's the power of God. And then the new version to put those who are being saved. So they make the actual salvation a process instead of an event. And the salvation of us from death to life is an event that already took place. It's not something we get maybe if we live good enough at the end of our lives. And that's what a lot of these translations are implying. So I'd have an issue with that, but we have to understand those verses like our salvation is nearer than when we first believe. It means Jesus is coming to rescue us all and give us the glorified body. Uh, say, because um, Paul says it this way, like you were saying, Brother Luke, nobody's sinlessly perfect in, the, in this life. He says, uh, who will save me from this body of death? And then he thanks Jesus that one day he'll be free from this body of death. So that, you know, that's the final salvation is, is the transforming of the body, I believe. All right. Do you see, though, that on the second point uh, yeah. of being saved, the concern I have is that, yes, on one hand, the spirit is there to help us to uh, overcome sin. But it, apparently it's not perfect because uh, nobody's able to completely overcome the sin. And, and if, if we claim that, hey, you should be able to completely overcome sin, 
uh, you have the power to overcome sin completely. So therefore, you better do that. Uh, and and uh, that's how you get your salvation. That's where Pelagius goes with yeah, it. Yeah, that's right. They they believed that God, the grace of God, is what gave you practical righteousness. It gave you that, just like now it gives you practical righteousness to earn your own self, and that's completely wrong. Uh, and so, yeah, I I see that. I hear a lot of people saying it. We we fail in our flesh every day. It's a battle every day to do what the spirit wants versus the flesh. But the key to that, again, is not looking at sin and the law, but keeping your eyes on Christ. I get what you're saying. Yeah, I don't want people to, to think that either. All right, right. Uh, Angel, you, you going to say more? I just wanted to say I, I never got to thank you for giving me a word for that because that Pelagianism is, the, is was one of the most like sinister and speaky little false doctrines I encountered when, you know, contending with people is that how they would try to somehow juggle grace and works in like the most subtle way possible, like especially for people observing the, the debate um, because they, they would, they would maintain, yes, we have, you know, you know, it's, it's grace through faith and it would be uh, because of, of, you know, God's grace, we are now able to, uh, uh, to live sinlessly. And um, I, I had never asked them exactly what they thought happened prior to the crucifixion, like, 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 I, I'm always curious what they think about that. But, but this is something I see more and more. I actually see this Pelagianism, like, uh, all over the place. Have you seen that, Renee? Yes, uh, there was a guy on my channel claiming that now, uh, and I explained it to Luke. He said, "Yep, that's Pelagianism, where they claim it's God's grace gives you the ability to keep the commandments enough to earn your own salvation, and that's just ridiculous." Uh, and they actually believe they're sinless. Like they forget about apathy, whatsoever's not of faith. I mean, they forget all these little ways that we fail in our flesh. And they really think that they're righteous now and they're sinlessly perfect. And they turn up their nose and look at everybody else and then mock mm -hmm. the real gospel. So I don't even think they're saved. I mean, sadly, okay. yeah. I don't see how. And they add in the willful sin. That's yeah. always a caveat. It's, no, no, no. It's just the willful sin that matters. All, all sins <laughs> have matters from God. <laughs> It says yeah, it in yeah, yeah. the Old Testament. A, a sin that a man does in ignorance and doesn't even realize yeah, yeah. is still on his account. Yeah, oh. ridiculous. And they get that from misunderstanding Hebrews 6. They don't understand the willful sin is rejecting the sacrifice of Jesus. Yeah, well, exactly what they're doing. Well, I don't sin on purpose. It's like, it's so stupid. <laughs> and so so. There's, you can't get through to these people. I mean, there is no getting through to them. They, they can't get it. So I, I've dealt with a lot of those. And those are the ones making videos against me right now, you know, calling me flesh peddler and all that. They, they can't get it because what they'll, what they're doing, Angel, is you were mentioning that about how they say it's grace. Here's what they do. They preach works, but then claim it's not really works. It's grace. And yeah. The double mindedness in, yeah. in action. Well, it's not works because it's God doing it in me. Uh, no, it still works no matter who you give credit to. It's not your works. It's what the work done on Calvary. That's what they can't get. It doesn't matter who is, you think is making you righteous in your flesh. It's still your righteousness. You know, but yeah. that's their trick. That's their trick. They'll preach works and then claim, but it's not really works. It's grace. That's it's a really doing. clever trick. I've seen yep. a lot of YouTube uh, false teachers whipping out lately. It, it's, it's over the past couple of years. Yep. Ugh. It can come back. I guess it's supposed to be like one of the earliest heresies, right, Luke? You're muted, bro. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, Pelagius. Uh, let me see. He he lived from uh, about 350 to uh, 420 or 440. Uh, so he was at the fourth, early fifth century, and. Uh, and the there, was a, there was a dispute between him and uh, Augustine, but Augustine was equally bad or worse than, than Pelagius. He just erred on the other side because all Calvinism came from, from uh, Augustine. Um, all right. Any, ben, did you answer the question? No, but it was my question. So, uh, oh, go so ahead. well, you guys pretty much, you guys very competently and expertly answered it, but um yeah, I totally agree that um, 
the Bible didn't make a lot of sense to me when I until I understood this concept. And in fact, I'm absolutely convinced that the whole reason uh, Arminianism and Calvinism exist is because they don't understand this these tenses. They that, that's why that's the, why they come to these conclusions. Um, and uh, so, yes, you know, when someone says to you, "Are you saved?" It'd be more accurate for us to say, "Yes, I have been saved. Yes, I'm being saved, and yes, I will be saved." And like, like you mentioned, Luke, the the past, you know, the the big saved past tense is, is the penalty for sin, which is separation from God. Uh, uh, the power of sin, um, I, yeah, I don't think anyone, uh, Luke, is, is suggesting that it, it's a it it uh, we're going to have complete victory over sin uh, in this lifetime. But as an unbeliever, you have absolutely no power over sin. You you are like you know you you are going to fall for its dictates. It's like a, a like a, a drill sergeant, you know, drop and give you 50. And you're going to say yes every time because you have you don't see anything wrong with it necessarily and you don't have any power to withstand it or any reason to withstand it. Um, but uh, I do believe the Holy Spirit does uh, gives us the knowledge and uh, the, the knowledge and the uh, uh, equips us essentially to uh, to escape uh, temptations um, it, by setting our, our mind on the things of the spirit. But none of us are are going to be uh, perfect at that because we there's a war uh no one fights that war between the flesh and the spirit perfectly there's a war but as we are in the spirit um that's what we can experience uh deliverance i believe from the power of sin uh, but again no one does that perfectly even paul said that he still had not arrived at the true resurrection life um but then also too so that's present tense the power of sin and the future tense is the presence of sin where we won't even sin won't even exist anymore um and if people say uh, there's no single verse that teaches the tenses of salvation, I think there are, are a few. But one of the ones I like the most is John 5, 24, because Jesus said, most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has, present tense, everlasting life, shall not come into judgment, future tense, but has passed from death to life, present tense. Um and so, actually, if you want to break, I have a little quote here. I'll, I'll keep it under 60 seconds, Luke. Uh, but it's, it's for, it, it talks about the Greek of this verse. And it says, um, the three contrasting tenses of salvation. And in this verse, he who believes in me has everlasting life, refers to the present possession of salvation, shall not come into judgment, promises future salvation. And three, has passed from death to life, refers to past salvation. Uh, yeah. Okay. And then... Um, yeah, so pre the present is the present possession of eternal life. Um, and then it says the Greek word, like meta babykin, is the perfect tense, active voice, indicative mood, form of the verb meta bino. Being the perfect tense and indicative mood, this verb form in the context indicates that the believer has passed out of death and into life in the past, with the result that the believer remains in the present, out of the realm of death, and in the sphere of life. Um, and he, yeah, so the, the Greek itself, I, again, I think that I've heard many times that Hebrew and Greek are the most accurate languages, and I don't think that's any coincidence. And um, I, I think it's helpful to get some additional um, insight from the Greek. Um, and, but even without Greek, you, just that verse alone, you, you see the three prints and tenses encapsulated in a single verse. So, All right. Thanks. Well, as I'm listening, I think of another kind of follow-up question that I'd like to get everybody's feedback for me. Uh, first, I, I think we need to acknowledge that uh, uh, the people on this panel and the people in the chat room, probably many of the people listening, um, I would say that for the most part, uh, if we were going to like rank a person's understanding of biblical uh, theology, uh, I would say that this is an above average group. P most people listening now know more about theology and Bible questions like these things than, than your average person, even, even your average Christian, the average person that, that they believe the gospel and they're saved, but they haven't studied to the extent that we are studying. That doesn't make us any, any better than, than them or any more saved than them. Um, but a lot of Christians don't pursue their Bible studies to the extent that, that we all do. Um, so my question is, um, how about all those people that never understood these three tenses? 
uh, I think that, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, as I'm asking, uh, if a person only understands the first and is not even aware of the present tense and the future tense uh, issue, but they understand that they have received eternal life, it's, you know, it's, it's guaranteed, it's irrevocable, they're saved because Jesus did it for, all for them. He paid for their sins. He promised them eternal life. That's, that's the only understanding they have is that they've been saved and it's settled. Uh, if they don't understand the present tense and the future tense as we do, um, is that essential? Do you think that they they have to have the, that deeper understanding of these things, or or is the first tense that I've been saved, it's done, I passed from death to life, is that enough in your opinion? I would say, say yes, absolutely. I, I don't think you have to understand the, the tenses. I just think it helps you understand scripture better. A lot of people probably haven't read enough to know that they would need to understand the tenses, you know, um, um, especially I'm thinking back in times where people were hearing the gospel preached, but they were illiterate. Uh, so I think that the, the understanding the tenses is really um, beneficial for those who are reading scripture to where they, you know, enough to where they can get hung up on these things. Um, uh, you know, the most important thing, uh, you know, because I, I know when I was growing up, I mean, my family never taught me about any of this, but what they did teach me was was the clear gospel and eternal security. And uh, and they, that was something that uh, even when I fought with them over it, because I didn't think it was fair, um, that they, they I, I don't think that they had any idea about the tenses. I mean, my grandfather was very knowledgeable but, uh, and, you know, a, like a scholarly person. But, um, you know, most of my family, they were, you know, they were, they read the Bible, but they didn't analyze and scrutinize and they, they knew that salvation was, you know, was settled upon believing. So whatever they saw in scripture past that, that it wouldn't ever make them worry or doubt. Uh, I, I, you know, surprisingly, like my dad, you know, I, I want to talk to, talk to my dad now uh, and ask him because he just always had this unflinching, unquestioning faith. It was just very matter of fact. Um, and that's like all my family, all my family has been that way. Um, and it's not, but it's not fake. It's, it's real, but it's, you know, uh, they didn't even pick it apart enough to, to have these questions or run into these things. They would never have seen, um, uh, uh, you know, let's say the, you know, uh, the, the, the the carnal tense of the word, you know, like, you know, being saved, like, or, you know, like Jesus saved me um, in the flesh, uh, uh, you know, what is one of the examples. They would never have uh, seen that example or the example that you were um, mentioning where it's, uh, you know, where we're, we're being saved from, you know, from the power of sin. They wouldn't have seen that and then let that, let that hang them up or even had a question in their mind about whether that means, man, could I, could I actually, you know, could this be a work in progress? Is this not a done deal? Because they understood that um, properly from the start. But uh, when you're somebody that's actually going to the Bible to, to try to understand it in order to believe, especially if you're, if you're seeking God, this is, a, it's very important. To, it's just like should be a, in every Bible tract that people pass out these, these principles, you know what I mean? Like that would be probably the most beneficial Bible tract. Uh, to people could actually distribute is these, you know, uh, helpful hints to understanding scripture. This is one of them. It's a good idea, actually. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a project for yourself. Yeah, I think so. Um, <laughs> I think so. Don't wait for someone else to do it. I, no, um, I'm going to do that. Uh, Sister Renee, thing. would you mind answering my question? I'd like to get your thoughts on it. What was your question again? Uh, it, it, what if a person didn't study the Bible to the extent that oh, we? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. They only understood the first tense. Yeah. Well, is here's that enough to get them saved. Of course it is, because I mean, look in the Bible, we see several instances of people getting saved. We see Cornelius, we see the Ethiopian eunuch, we see the Philippian jailer, and all that was done is they preached Jesus Christ crucified and risen for the payment for their sins and eternal life. And once he explained what Jesus had accomplished, they either trusted him or they didn't. They either believed, yes, he's the son of God. He did this. This was prophesied. I believe it. Uh, or they didn't. So it's just a matter of trusting whether your savior accomplished saving you or not. And sadly, most Christians don't believe it. They just don't believe 
that what Jesus did gave them eternal life. They're still trying to get there through something they're doing. That's why Jesus says the narrow is the way, straight is the gate, because he is the narrow way. I am the way. I am the door to the sheepfold. They, they, uh, you know, they weren't theologians in the early church. Now, what we do see is once they were saved, they would study the scrolls. They would, the Bereans, they search the scriptures to see if these things were so, and they would confirm it. Uh, so yeah, but we see, uh, people falling away from the faith and the simplicity of the gospel, even before Paul was dead. He warned that it was going to happen after. And you can see right after in the first and second century, some of the church quote fathers started to fall away from the simplicity in Christ. So we have to use the Bible as our uh, standard uh, because by the time the Roman Catholic Church came around, they had hardly anything in common with a real biblical church uh, that Paul started. Um, a lot, they did not have to, a lot of these people were illiterate. Uh, they they couldn't even read. And so it was literally hearing the message of who Jesus is, what he had done for them, and their simple childlike trust in him as Savior. That's all that was necessary, and that's all that's still necessary. Amen. Um, all right. Yeah, well, I just thought that was a, an important point to get clarified because um, we're, we're sometimes we get into some pretty deep things and uh, I find it all fascinating. Not everybody is as fascinated with the Bible as we are, but um, we love to just pull back the layer after layer and really and have all these deeper understandings. Um, but most people, uh, they either don't put in the effort or never come to these, uh, this greater understanding that we, we were desiring. Uh, but we shouldn't look down on those people and we should certainly never uh, uh, judge their salvation based upon how clearly they understand all these uh, these uh, deeper things. Uh, it's really very simple. Um, and and it, it, let's not impose any more on them than to just, hey, Jesus paid for my sins. I'm going to go to heaven. He promised it to me. That's it. Uh, so anything imposing anything else on someone then is um would be a big mistake okay um all right if there's no more on that question that took longer than i thought i thought we were going to answer that one like the uh the lust question <laughs> okay brother ben what's the next one okay true or false since we are saved by grace we can forget everything written in the law because it no longer applies to us this was Heather Bridgman's question. Oh, okay. All right. Heather, she has to go last then. Oh, she's not on the panel, so she doesn't have to go last. Uh, all right, Angel, why don't you go first on this one? I would say, uh, well, why would you want to do that? Uh, false, because um, for one, it's written um, it's written on our, you know, God's, God's law, it, it also functions as our conscience. Uh, it, it's written... Uh, written in our hearts, and um, I was actually trying to explain this to somebody today that, um, you know, whether, you know, I like how Matthias has explained it in the past, uh, that, you know, keeping God's laws, keeping the commandments, um, kind of like people keep the stars. Um, if for nothing else, uh, I find that it's, uh, it, it, it's a really great way to uh, really manage your life and try to keep yourself, uh, keep yourself uh, you know, because it's easy to get it's easy to get caught up and and to to really kind of get caught up in the world and to uh, to not ever really check yourself and check yourself against God's standards. You know, uh, there, there's they're more than just for salvation. It's also the this would be in this fallen world that you know a lot of those a lot of you know His laws are the most harmonious. They're things that are naturally harmonious for your life if you were to um, you know uh, actually keep them to the best of your ability, they're not going to hurt you. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, I don't find myself referring to the 10 commandments in order to do that. I, uh, I, you know, I, I have the Holy spirit. So, um, I, it's more for me when I feel adrift, it has nothing to do with, um, really the commandments I'm keeping or breaking. It's, it's more the, the, the relationship with God, the time with God, 
Um, so I can understand why somebody might say that, but there's so much in the law that's important, uh, you know, for event, like per the purpose of evangelism and under you know, trying to explain to the unbeliever, you know, things, things in scripture. I mean, I, especially the whole Old Testament, it's like the, you know, uh, it's like the, uh, the key to the new Testament and vice versa. Um, but just like, uh, uh, you know, Renee, was it Renee that pointed out why, uh, you know, a perfect example of why it, it, it's total, you know, BS when they tell you that only willful sin counts because we know in the old Testament, um, you had to, you know, you had to, you know, pay the same sacrifice for inadvertent sin, you know, and the sin of omission. Um, and so the law is uh, a, just an incredible tool for so many different reasons. So I would never want to forget it. I would never want to forget the Old Testament. Uh, I find that it's actually, you know, I, whereas I used to, I used to think, uh, you know, when I was just approaching faith, um, but, you know, I still was not a believer at all and knew very little. I wanted to somehow cleave Jesus away from the Old Testament. I wanted to to, to make the, you know, just like the Gnostics do, I wanted to take, make, take the New Testament and somehow um, condemn the Old Testament with the New Testament. And and, and um, there's even this crazy belief that the God of the Old Testament is, is Satan and that Jesus, his real purpose was to come here and it was the secret that he needed to tell the world, but he had to be very veiled in how he said it because the, you know, basically the, the wheat and the tares, they apply that, you know, that, uh, that uh, parable to it where they say that basically he couldn't be too blunt and state it, you know, openly because the world wasn't ready. So he didn't want to pull the, the weed up with the tears, so to speak. But um, that, that mentality that so many lost people have where they think that the, the two can't be reconciled. Um, I, I find that it's, it's, it's just the opposite because uh, when I realized that God was telling us the law um, in the old Testament was, the way that it is for a reason, it's harsh for a reason because God wants to show us what, what the result is. If we try to earn his love, if we try to have that um, employer employee relationship with what, you know, with, with God who's supposed to be our father. Um, and um, you know, once we realize that Christ is all over the old Testament and he's in every, every aspect of the law and God's law is perfect. His, his law is just, it's, you know, it's, we fall short of it, um, but he may, he had to make it uh, steep enough that we'd actually see the reason why we would prefer grace to trying to keep the law, which is impossible. Um, but, uh, but I would never want to forget that. Um, and um, I'm not sure if she meant forget in terms of, uh, you know, not referring to it in order to check ourselves, or she may just forget altogether. Um, and not, you know, totally out of our mind, but I, I find myself pondering the old Testament and, uh, uh, and the Mosaic law, uh, more than the new Testament. Uh, now that, uh, you know, ever since, you know, I got it a couple of years in, I find it more fascinating. So I would say false. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, sister Renee, what do you say? Yeah, well, I was just thinking of what you, you had posted. Uh, it's clear it said that the Gentiles do what was naturally right, and they were never given the law. Yeah. So here's the thing. I think you don't see Paul giving the Ten Commandments to the saved Gentiles. You don't see it. You don't see him even mentioning any of that. He, he gives them the gospel, and then the Spirit sent him, and he says, now you have God in you, Christ in you, leading you into what's righteous. He's here to comfort you and teach you, right? The, and then we, we hear that the heart of the law is supposed to be love, love and mercy. If you love God, you won't worship other gods. If you love others, you won't steal from them. You won't lie. So we don't need this dead letter telling us, don't do this, don't do that. And again, as you pointed out, Angel, the point of the law was to show us our guilt, and our need for a savior. Uh, that's the only purpose I see it's good for. It says it's also made for the unrighteous, not the righteous. Uh, there have to be some laws in place uh, and consequences by man. Like man's judicial system needs to have consequences for these laws, like lying or breaking a contract or stealing. There needs to be, or there'll be no order. And God has set up these systems of government to keep the unrighteous from completely victimizing innocent people. 
right? Those that don't care about what we're doing right. So it's necessary in that sense. But in regards to salvation, we never see Paul bringing the law to the Gentiles. He says, you, you know, you've trusted Christ. Now God dwells in you. You know what you're supposed to do. And it's all about love. So you shouldn't be suing each other in a court of law. Just go ahead and let them defraud you. Yeah. Love can speak louder than this. As a matter of fact, the righteousness of the law fulfilled in us is the standards for us are greater than the law. We establish the law. We show you how high it is and how impossible to earn salvation it is through. But we go a step further. We, we would, you know, uh, Jesus said, if someone asks you to walk a mile, go two with them, right? So we even do more than what the law would demand in the, in the dead letter. So as Christians, we don't need a list. We don't need anyone to tell us what's right or wrong. We know there. I mean, every one of us knows uh, when we don't treat someone in grace and in love or when we get in our flesh or when we're doing something dishonest. We don't we don't need uh, to be shown the law to know that. So I don't see any purpose of the law other than one to show us our, our need for a savior. And two, for those that are unrighteous, like it says, uh, because it keeps, we, we have our judicial system based on these laws to keep the unrighteous from victimizing the rest of us. So, um, but as far as for salvation, nobody needs that. Nobody needs to be told uh, what's right and wrong because uh, God himself shows us daily. Yeah, amen. Is somebody applauding you? Did I hear applause? My son's aunt was in the other room listening. <laughs> oh, yeah. I applaud you, too. That was a perfect answer. Um, ben, I don't know what you can do, but um, it seems like somebody's uh, racking up the votes there for certainly true. I saw it going up another one, another one, like that quickly. Uh, so I think one person has voted probably 10 or 15 times. Um are certainly true. I did vote certainly true myself. Uh, the question uh, is, uh, um, where is it? Since we are saved by grace, we can forget everything written in the law because it no longer applies to us. So um, the, the key that really made me that say, okay, certainly true is the word can. Yeah, we can. Oh, uh, yeah. I see. Uh -huh. Uh, we can uh, disregard the law if we want to. It's not going to affect your salvation because you're not saved by understanding it, following it, keeping it, any, anything else. So we can forget it. Now, should we? Uh, I, I, I say yes. Amen. Everything that Renee said is exactly right. And I, I did uh, post a, a verse here for a reason um, in, in Romans 2, 14 through 16, it says, for when the Gentiles, which have not the law, now wait a second, Gentiles don't have the law. He's talking about the law of Moses here. Gentiles do not have the law. So that's the first thing. Most Christians don't understand this. That law of Moses, that was Moses took and brought to the Israelites, that was for Israel. It wasn't for the whole world. It's not for us today. It never has been. I'm sorry to break the news to you. Some of you are going to hate me. Some of you are going to be shocked. But the truth is, it says here, for when the Gentiles, which have not the law, and we never did, and we're not supposed to be under the Mosaic law, but it says the Gentiles do my nature, the things contained in the law. So the, 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 the heart of the intention of the laws of, of Moses, uh, what's contained in that, we do naturally because uh, by, it's natural for us because having not the law are a law unto themselves which show the work of the law written in their hearts. So the essence of the laws of Moses, the, um, which Jesus condensed into love God with your whole heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, uh, that is written in uh, the heart of every person through their conscience. And how did we get this understanding? Because when Adam and Eve decided to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, 
That's what they acquired, the knowledge of good and evil, understanding right and wrong, and a conscience that comes with it. When you do wrong, your conscience is, is pricked. And, and so that's what they got when they ate from the tree. That is genetically passed down to every human being. We all have a conscience by nature. Uh, it says, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness and their thoughts, the mean while accusing or else excusing one another in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. Uh, so that's the first point that people need to understand. Uh, can we, uh, back to the question, uh, it says, uh, since we are saved by grace, we can forget. Yeah, not only can we forget, we are never intended to be under the law anyway of Moses. Uh, but getting back to this law of Jesus, love God and love your neighbor, let me ask you something. What's easier, to follow the laws of Moses, which says don't take more than this number, this number of steps on the Sabbath or else you're, you're working on the Sabbath. So limit your steps and, and don't uh, go any farther than that. Uh, well, you can remember not to do that. Is, is it harder to do that, or is it harder to love God with your whole heart, soul, mind, and strength? Is it is it easier to follow a law of Moses, or is it is it uh, easier to love your neighbor as yourself? I'd say that Jesus condensed the law, but he didn't make it easier. Yeah. It's certainly yeah, harder, far harder to do the, the commands of Jesus than it is the laws of Moses. All right. Oh, Luke. Yeah. So I want to just make sure nobody, I wasn't saying that we can't forget the laws or, or else, but the reason I answered the way I did was because today I was explaining to a, you know, I guess a, a nihilistic uh, agnostic person. Uh, she was trying to basically claim that there's no such thing as like objective good or bad. And uh, uh, with the, uh, with the um, example of prostitution, like why should that be bad? Why is that, you know, you know, why does that have to be a shameful thing, whatever? And I was explaining that, uh, you know, whether or not she acknowledged, you know, the God of the Bible and his word and what he tells us that, uh, that, you know, he gave us all a conscience. And so we know when we're doing something that is, um, you know, uh, something that we, you know, like the shame that we feel, it tends to be almost a reflex. It's not. It's not really that some that society indoctrinated us to believe stealing is wrong. For instance, uh, that's why I, that was the, the uh, mentality I was I was coming from was more uh, thinking about um, how the law is written on our hearts, so it's like our conscience is our conscience. So I, I feel in a way that we can't forget it because we will always, you know, we'll always have that instinct where we, you know, we know when we've done something wrong, but. Um, from the, the perspective that you're coming from, yeah, I totally, I totally uh, agree that uh, for for safe believers, yeah, for all of his purposes, we could, uh, and you know, we can forget it, and we should forget it, and you know, when it comes to whether or not we're we're pleasing God, because that's not how we please God. And you're right, it wasn't for the uh, the Gentiles anyway. So, I, sorry, uh, I was kind of thinking of it from a different angle. Mm, that's all right. No apology necessary, sister. Uh, all right, Ben, uh, your turn to answer. You get the last answer here. Okay, well, you guys covered much of it. Um, but I would say uh, also, too, you guys mentioned the word can, but also it also you could take – it's how you take the word law because uh, the Bible yes. itself refers to the Torah, the first five books, as the law even. So yes. um, in that sense, I would say definitely uh, it would not be wise for us to forget it. In fact, Paul even – I mean, I think uh, all the epistle writers uh, recounted episodes in the in the Torah that um, that were for were for our benefit, for an, a sample for us to follow or not follow, uh, as it were, because of you know we, we, that we shouldn't lust after the things they lusted after and things like that. So, um, in that sense, yes, I, I, when, I when I sell the law again, uh, it's not just the Ten Commandments. Um, like for example, uh, there's a, a verse in Deuteronomy that says, "Do not add to God's word or take from God's word." Well, we see that same. Um, stipulation at the end of Revelation where it says do not add or uh, take from the words of this book. Um, so, uh, yeah, again, yeah, like you guys all said, we're not under the law, but for, for believers, uh, they were not, the Old Testament was not written to us, but it was written for us. Um, yes. And so in that, in that sense, um, I, 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 I love the Old Testament for that reason. Okay, see, I thought I got it wrong by thinking that the law also encompassed uh, 
you know, more than just that, like, I, like, like what you said about the Old Testament and uh, the five chapters, I, uh, uh, five books, I mean, um, I, I was, because that's what I think when I think of it uh, initially, I always think of it just uh, being much more than just the, the actual laws, the actual, uh, you know, uh, bylaws with uh, mosaic uh, ritual and uh, uh, laws and all of that. So I, uh, glad you said that then. So that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I think that uh, Ben tricked us. Uh, That's not my question. It wasn't my question. It was so. Heather's question. Oh, it was Heather's yeah. question. Okay. Well, I don't know if, if uh, that was the intention of Heather, if she was thinking uh, the law was the first five books or the, the laws as uh, elucidated in uh, uh, Deut Deuteronomy and Leviticus. Uh, so, uh, I, but you are correct that... Um, the first five books is can be called the law, and then the prophets are the remaining books. So in that sense, uh, yeah, it's certainly more important because those are the things we need to study and take into account. But uh, um, uh, yeah, I didn't I didn't think of it in that way. So you got me with that one, Ben. Uh, good one. Well, I was going to ask you, uh, I, 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 I assumed, I, I thought that was the case. I was going to ask you guys. I know the first five books are, are known as the law, and everything else is basically the prophets. So you confirm I that. I didn't know that. I was wondering yeah. what the prophets were. I think, yeah. Okay. Yep. Uh, and uh, also, too, Luke, the, the abuse of overvoting. Yeah, there's not, not a whole lot I could do about that. I mean, there's something I could do about it, but would, the solution would be worse than the, the, uh, the problem because it would require everyone to log into it with it with an account and, and set that up and they'd be kind of a pain. Um, so it's either anonymous or you make people go through a bunch of hoops. Um, so everyone is listening. Um, if you're voting more than once, please don't. Uh, it's the honor system. There's no, you're not proving anything. Um, so are, are we ready for the next one, Luke? You're yeah. muted. Yes, please. Okay. Okay, this is my question, and I know you guys are going to think it's weird, and I whatever. <laughs> it's, it's a kind of fun one. Oh, wait, wait, before, wait actually, before I go, I, I've been doing a poor job of reading the comments. I, uh, I, oh, I, I was just going to ask about that. Yeah, I don't want to forget about that. I, I apologize for people who have made comments. Um, for this particular one, uh, this last question we had uh, about whether or not you, we, should, we should forget about the law, um, one person says, why would I want to disobey? Disobey my daddy. I love him. Another person says, by grace, I'm saved, not of the law. So, I think we kind of touched on those. Okay, the next question. Um, this, this is my question. Again, just kind of weird, but whatever. Uh, the, okay, the question is true or false. The brain determines intelligence. The brain determines intelligence hmm okay well uh angel you look like you're ready to go go ahead you can go first uh, i will just say false on a lark because um once <laughs> i got saved and i had the holy spirit uh it was like a, a whole new ball game for me in terms of my understanding of what i would call intelligence it's hard to it's hard to really uh quantify or define intelligence um when you really think about it, what really counts as intelligence. But, uh, for, you know, as far as uh, for my own purposes, um, I would have thought that all my life, that it was your brain, uh, that your IQ or whatever. But once I, once I had the Holy Spirit, uh, once I really saw the Holy Spirit, like the power of the Holy Spirit, like, and the way that it was like God could download information, download under, it, it was such a, like my eyes opened up and I could actually um, make sense of, of, of you know, of the information I'd just been taking in all my life and uh, uh, coming to really <laughs> horrible conclusions about honestly, even though I thought it was pretty clever. Um, and I see how I came to those conclusions, but they were, you know, I was totally blind. I had no, had no, uh, like whatever intellect I thought I had um, or, um, you know, intelligence, I guess it's the same thing. It, w it really was all for naught and it actually ended up getting in my way and so uh, you know it made it harder for me to understand uh, it made it harder for me to believe it made me made it harder for me to be humble and uh, to actually even see the point of seeking God so uh, in that sense um, you know I don't even know what you even call that intelligence because at the end of it like 
if it doesn't benefit you and it actually uh, it actually is it's to your detriment, is it really intelligence? You know, because like it's it, it, I don't know, to me that's a subjective word, but uh, I believe that the Holy Spirit and uh, and God really is, is you know. I believe that's where you know any intelligence is worth anything comes from. So false. All right, thank you. Well, let me see. I didn't vote yet, so let me post my vote real quick. I'm going to say um, the brain determines intelligence. Um, I'm going to say leaning true. Uh, let me see if it'll register here. I'm not so confident in my answer that I'm going to say certainly true, but I'm going to say leaning true. Um, but first, I... I guess that begs the question of what is intelligence? Um, yeah. I'm, I'm thinking that intelligence is the ability to learn and understand things. I, let me, I did just look it up. Let me see. What does it say? Um, the ability to acquire and apply knowledge and skills. Um, so working with that definition of intelligence, uh, I do think that people um, uh, do have, uh, they are born with um, brains that have different capacities. I mean, there are ways of measuring it. We can actually test uh, in a way to determine uh, the person's ability to understand complex things and apply them. And uh, th there are certainly some things, some areas, some subject matter I feel not very intelligent. I, my ability to understand certain things, uh, I, I'm not very good. Um, I think in other areas, I have better better intelligence. So it, maybe it's not a broad thing where a person is so intelligent across the board, but maybe they're highly intelligent in one area, but not so much in another. I, I'm not so sure about all that. But I do think that it's anatomical, physiological. Uh, uh, and so I do think that it's our brain. Um, and, uh, the brain determines. Now, the um, there is a group of people who believe in um, um, the so, what they call soul sleep or the unconscious state of the dead. That they believe that when people die, that um, while they're waiting for the resurrection, uh, that they uh, they're completely dead. They say it's unconscious uh, or soul sleep, but it, when you dig and you really look into what how they would explain it, and if you probe and ask enough questions, you'll find out that they, they really believe in a complete death. When a person dies, that they not only do we all agree their body dies, uh, but they believe that their, their mind, um, and their soul, is not, does not exist apart from a physical brain, that your mind is, is only a function of a brain, uh, and so it, it, it requires tissue, it calls, requires nerve, it requires uh, the electrical activity, all these things, the material, it's called a material, materialist view. It's strictly based on materialism, the physical matter. Um, and I, I do think that a person has certain um, uh, abilities based upon the physical attributes of, of our, each of our brains. Uh, obviously, some people have a very diminished capacity, and other people seem to have much greater capacity. So I do think it is physiological, and it is the brain. But where I disagree with the, the soul sleep advocates uh, is that I do believe that our mind or soul is something that is, is, exists apart from the physical brain. Even when we die and our brain has rotted and no longer functions at all, I believe that we do have a consciousness that is the soul that exists apart from the, the physical brain. And that soul is conscious and aware, waiting for the resurrection and the judgment. Um, all right, maybe I went off on a tangent there, but I thought they thought those things were connected ideas. Um, all right, uh, who would like to go next? I guess Renee. Stepped away for one second. Can you read it, Ben? Yes. Uh, the brain determines intelligence. True or false? Uh, it depends on what you mean, because intelligence quotient 
is the ability to figure th problems out with the knowledge you have. So intelligence, uh, it depends on what you mean. Like wisdom comes from God. I've seen people uh, study scripture for 50 years and still be clueless about what God is saying in his revelations. And then I've seen my son, seven years old, get it. Uh, I told you guys one time I was explaining why it offended me so much to see these uh, old Catholic monks in the Middle Ages beating themselves bloody and doing all this penance and all this other stuff. And uh, Jesus, uh, Jim right away said, well, it's offensive because Jesus already did it. And so wow. he understood wow. what he accomplished through. That's, that's wisdom from God right there. Yeah, that's my point. That's my point because I had a high IQ and I was a, an idiot. Like, you know, as far as I'm concerned, none of my knowledge or my application of it was worth anything. My whole life as a lost person. I, I mean, I, I wouldn't have gotten that at seven. I was at, at that age. I was I was too busy thinking heaven would be miserable because I have to sit around with God all day in a toga right. <laughs> with some sheep. That's what I, he, he was that because that's the difference with Holy Spirit. It's amazing. Right. So uh, it depends on what you mean as intelligence. It, it, that's our physical organ that helps us process like a computer to process the knowledge we have. But I think there's spiritual intelligence that goes beyond the brain. That when we leave this body, we don't have a physical brain. And I think there's knowledge that we have in our spiritual person, our spiritual man that comes from God. Uh, and surpasses uh, uh, the you know once we leave the physical realm. But if we're talking about like intelligence, uh, it, general knowledge and retention and memories for our physical body are held in the brain. It's processed by the brain. But real wisdom and application of knowledge, uh, the beginning. What does it say? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And that and comes the wisdom of the world is foolishness. Yes, that comes from somewhere else. That comes for spirit, I think. Awesome. Oh, hey, Ben, I want to say real quick to uh, the memory cells in the rest of your body too. Like, like the reason why people get when they get transplants, organ transplants, they'll get like these strange memories and and all of that from um, from the donor. Uh, allegedly, I mean, it could not, honestly, it could be a spiritual, uh, like uh, sometimes I wonder if it's not demonic parlor tricks, but they have uh, surmised that memory cells are exist throughout the body and not just within the brain. So I don't know if that factors in the question, but I want to say that for you answered. That's a good point. Yeah, I, uh, I think everyone's gone, right? Right, Luke? Everyone's addressed this. Is that for, okay, this is my question. Uh, I thought would, it, you would uh, generate some interesting thoughts. Um, and I, I'll, everything you guys said was uh, uh, awesome. Um, and the reason I thought about this is that a couple of reasons. Well, well, uh, um, you know, I, I started thinking that maybe the brain is really. I mean, you know, we know whales, for example, have massive brains, but they're they don't show any more intelligence than we than we have. Um, and um, and also too, I know that the density of the brain is as a factor, and the convolutions, uh, you know, how how densely packed it is. But I was just thinking, you know, that. Uh, where, where, where it comes to evangelization and things like that, um, you know, I know for a fact, like I'll be, I'll, I'll read a word in my head for for many times. I, I'll, I'll say it correctly in my head, but then I'll struggle to verbalize it. Um, and that, you know, again, I, I always think that the brain is really more is is it really the, the size of the brain or, or how you know, how well how healthy the brain is is more uh, a factor in how well we can express ourselves. Um, but doesn't necessarily limit our our, our intelligence. I'm thinking. Uh, so I wonder sometimes, like if some people that are you know paralyzed, it's like they don't understand anything. They actually understand quite a bit. Uh, you hear stories where people are in comatose and they uh, understand all kinds of conversations that they've heard, um, uh, or people will come out of comatose and they'll understand, uh, or they'll start playing the piano. <laughs> you know, be an expert in piano they never never played it before. Um, and so again, I just think a lot of times. I know for a fact for me is that uh, when I was a kid, especially, uh, I wasn't particularly good at math or really had a strong interest in math, but I really liked computers. And, and I was told that, oh, well, no, if you want to understand computers and go into computers, you have to understand logic and do a lot of math. And I was really not really good or had a lot of interest in either of those things, but um, I was definitely interested in computers. And so um, 
all the things I struggled with, I was had such a zeal and, and such an interest and a passion for computers uh, that I, I I forced myself to learn those things. And, and I didn't yet ac actually end up, didn't really even need to, to do that, but I did because uh, I wanted to understand it well. And so I'm convinced that, uh, you know, uh, people limit themselves uh, based on, oh, well, you know, you're not good at that. Or, uh, you, you know, you come from a family that's not uh, not great at sports or whatever. Um, I'm, I'm convinced that, you know, if you put your will to it, uh, your spirit to it, you can uh, you can overcome all those things. Because I think ultimately the spirit is what determines um, what we can and can't do. And uh, like like Renee said, uh, I think there is a, a we overlook a lot of times the spiritual intelligence. And, and that comes from with from God, obviously. But uh, um, what was I going to say? Something else too. Yeah. Again, I, I just think that a lot of times we, we underestimate um, people, and we say, "Oh, we can't understand the gospel," and and when in fact they can. Um, so again, I think the the brain it just way it kind of controls the, our body more than anything. That's why we have a, a complex brain because we have the most some of the most complex movements of any creature that God created. Uh, but I don't, I'm not convinced that it, it, it determines intelligence because there's people with you know very small brains and much smaller people uh, that are much more intelligent than larger people. Uh, so there's all kinds of factors that play into that. And I thought I just think that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd like to add that uh, um, I, I've always felt that um, intelligence is really overrated. Now you might say, well, that's probably because you're not very intelligent and you feel you're insecure, so you don't want to think intelligence is so important. <laughs> Maybe that's true, but but I think well, it's, there's a, a saying. Uh, I don't know. I think Calvin Coolidge said it, um, talking about how talent is not the most important thing and genius is not. Uh, 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 all these uh, wonderful attributes are, are, they're not as important as one thing, and that's persistence and determination. Uh, that's omnipotent is what he says. This is all, the most important thing is the person's determination. Uh, but I, I like the way uh, that uh, Forrest Gump uh, said it. Uh, he says, my mama taught me that stupid is as stupid does. And so I think that uh, I would judge a person's intelligence by the, th if, are they doing stupid things? If you do stupid things, I don't care what your IQ is, you're stupid. Uh, if you're doing smart things, you're smart. That's how I would judge it. I know a lot of brilliant, genius philosophers living in their mom's basement. Right. You know, right. there's nothing... There's a lot of people too smart for their own good because knowledge puffeth up too. People forget that. It can. I've seen a lot of people in regards to scripture yep. that are prideful because they can memorize where the verse is, and but they literally cannot see the shadows and the revelation and God's grace all through scripture. You know, it's better. Somebody was asking in the chat room how can somebody read the bible and get prideful well, well the, it tells us because they they think themselves righteous and despise others so they cannot see the little ways in which they're they fail god's perfection in thought word and deed and they think if they live by the dead letter i don't drink i don't smoke i don't lie i don't fornicate i'm good i don't sin and then they judge everybody else around them and they think they really don't sin but they can't see the love that's not there the love of christ that doesn't go out to others you know and it's it's sheer blindness and and knowledge does puffeth up if you, you think you you know everything it, there, it's nothing good. And I would agree in the sense of what Luke is saying. It's the application of the knowledge. That's what an intelligence quotient is, is to to problem solve with it, to make good decisions based on the knowledge you have. And so, you know, the world's wisdom is foolishness to God. I mean, you look at some of the most brilliant physicists and astrophysicists and they all believe the lie of evolution, and uh, the, and the world would consider them brilliant, but to God, they're they're foolish. By their wisdom, they became fools. 
because they have no spiritual truth, no spiritual knowledge. And um, so in a way, I, what you said, you know, stupid is as stupid does. There's a lot to that. I also think that the heart is the filter to intelligence. So the heart sees what it wants to see. So an evil heart won't see good, for example. And I think that's partly how Satan didn't see God's mercy. He didn't anticipate God's mercy. He was blind to it, just like the Pharisees. And, um, and so it was a, it, it served as a filter. They couldn't even reason. In fact, the, the, the reasons they were given for Christ being able to cast out the uh, demon were, it, were illogical. It was like it, they couldn't even... They couldn't see it. It was a filter. They it didn't. They couldn't get past their heart into their intellect, but their intellect only saw what it wanted to. The heart did. And again, they couldn't even come up with a reasonable explanation uh, right. for why he was able to do that. So that's that that's is interesting. Amen. The heart as a filter. I mean, we see that with Jesus and the Pharisees. I mean, they kept very strict law. They were doctors of the law, but they were wicked. They, they might have kept the dead letter, but the heart of it they missed, love and mercy. Jesus told many stories about Pharisees that walked to the other side of the road to keep themselves ritually clean rather than to show compassion. They thought God would be more displeased with them getting themselves ritually unclean by being to a possible dead body than that he would be upset that they didn't show compassion to a stranger that was harmed. You know, this is the blindness that they had this is what he said your, your whitewashed tombs full of dead man's bones they look good on the outside everybody thought they were righteous but they jesus condemned these people so i agree that the heart could be uh, uh a filter for the intelligence ben that's interesting hmm. yeah very interesting uh you know i did a, a verse by verse teaching on the book of proverbs and um, throughout the book, there's references to knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. And when you, uh, by the time you're finished studying that book, you, you realize that these are uh, levels. Uh, knowledge is the most basic. Um, and, and then uh, uh, more advanced than knowledge is understanding. Uh, you, just, you don't just know what a fact is, but now you understand deeper things about the fact. And then wisdom is being able to apply that in a constructive way. So it's kind of like uh, uh, knowledge is what and, and uh, understanding is why. Why does that work that way? And then, and then wisdom is how, how. How do I apply this now? So... Um, the knowledge is really, as I said, the, it's the most basic thing. Far better is understanding and wisdom. wisdom. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Um, any more on that before we go to the, the next question? We probably have time for one more. Okay. Uh, the next question is true or false. Doing good works is an insult to the grace of God. <laughs> Oh, okay. I think it's helpful, Heathers. All right. Uh, who wrote that one, Ben? I believe that was Heathers. Actually, before we go into that, let me read the comments from the last one. Okay. Um, yeah. Someone says, Intelligence is a gift from the Holy Spirit. Um, the, another person says, The structure and efficiency of the brain determines the, determines the capacity for intelligence, but God has the spirit of wisdom which he can impart to any man. And a third person says, I think it, intellect is an ability to learn. The brain is a chemical reactive binary computer. Wisdom comes from God, and knowledge is of the, of the Gnostics, LOL. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. All right, Ben, why don't you go first on this one? Uh, well, I, I, okay, so this question, whether or not uh, doing good works is an insult to the grace of God, I would say it really depends on the motivation. Uh, God always gets to the heart of the matter. He always, he wants to know about, he always, Christ, you know, God always <laughs> is looking at the heart. Um, and so if it's if it's based out of, uh, you know, to gain an advantage for, you know, to flatter someone for, for, uh, for whatever reason, to gain an advantage with them, uh, obviously that is an insult to the grace of God. If it's uh, related to salvation, obviously it's that's a major insult to the grace of God. Uh, but if it's out, if it's born out of a you know cheerful heart 
from a born again uh, believer in service to God and to others, I believe God absolutely is not, that's not an insult at all. The, in fact, we're supposed to stir each other up for that very reason. Um, but yes, but that if you're, yes, yeah, so essentially if you're an unbeliever, um, good works is an insult to, to the grace of God. Um, if again, you're trying to do it for ultimately, I think good works by an unbeliever is done out of selfish reasons. Ultimately, uh, there's some kind of selfish uh, motive behind it. Um, either what you know, whether they're trying to save themselves or gain favor with God or, uh, just soothe their own conscience. Um, but from a believer, uh, if it's done out of a cheerful heart, again, God, that's what God loves. And so I would say in that case, absolutely not. It's not an insult because you're doing it out of, you know, you're saved, you know, you're doing, you're doing it out of, out of thankfulness to God and uh, wanting to uh, help others. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. All right. Sister Renee. Yeah. I'll go a step further and say, if you're unsaved, you can't do anything good. You don't have any good works at all. Uh, because Jesus said, if you're not in him, you can't bring forth fruit. So there's nothing you can even do that God would consider good. All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. In our unsaved state, we think we're good. We're giving, But like Ben said, it's usually motive. If you do it because you feel good. It made you feel good. Even our best efforts are for our own gratification in some way. So Jesus said, unless you're in him, you, you can't do anything good anyway. So, uh, and Paul tells us in regards to salvation, it's for him that worketh not but believes. And the reason is, if you're working or trying to do good works to be saved, or you think not sinning is keeping you saved, then you don't realize it's the sacrificial blood of Jesus that cleansed you from all unrighteousness, gave you eternal life and reconciled you to God. That's the gospel message. So you're either, if you're working for it, you're not believing. So it's one or the other, your righteousness or the righteousness of God by faith in the finished work of Jesus. And by the way, that's the only way to salvation. It's the only way to heaven is to be in Christ. And so, but once we're saved, the Bible says we are saved unto good works that we, before we're ordained, that we should walk in them. And that's exactly our purpose. So again, like Daryl was saying yesterday, salvation is the beginning. Now we begin our walk and our purpose in serving God and being a light to the world. So good works are not an insult to the grace of God. They glorify God. It says, you know, once you're saved and you do these good works, it's to give God glory so men can see him and, and glorify God. But it, it, if you're trying to think that that's assisting you in getting salvation, then you don't understand what Christ accomplished on the cross and you haven't believed the gospel. But an unsaved person can't do anything good relatively good in man's eyes no matter how much good you think you're doing if you're lost it's filthy rags you it's not possible to do anything good or meritorious in god's eyes if you're not in christ amen all right sister angel um so i that she she put it perfectly but um um, I'm just going to approach the question as though she's she's speaking in terms of uh, like if you're trying to submit your works uh, for salvation um, as grounds for your entry into eternity with God. Um, the way that I try to explain it to people um, who uh, may come from the perspective I came from not understanding the first thing about the Bible, um, trying to make it make sense for them is that um, if we were uh, in a state where we had to earn our salvation, uh, via good works, or at least that we thought we did. We were trying to submit our, our good works before God, not only but the uh, uh, cheapening uh, immortality, which is, which is what, what God is granting us when we have eternal life. It's, it, you know, uh, making us immortal. And that's an irrevocable promise um, that, uh, you know, he's not going to go back on. And to, 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 to even presume that anything that we could do um, in our in our flesh in our fallen state could ever be worthy uh, like enough to merit us immortality is 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 insulting um, to God yes absolutely especially because we, we know that Christ 
is the only one who's ever uh, been perfect 100% in thought, word, and deed from start to finish, which is the, it is the standard for eternity. God cannot allow the least little bit of sin um, into eternity because I, I like to see it as sort of a, um, it would snowball. Like, so even the littlest white lie would snowball um, into, uh, you know, just all the vile, wicked hate that we see from Satan himself. He's not necessarily immortal, but uh, for all intents and purposes, he, he is uh, so far, he's, he's been around for a long time. And we see, I would, I would imagine he grows more and more wicked by the day, um, especially in a state of separation from God. He's sort of the, you know, the opposite of God. So that's why we can't, that we have to be perfect even to have um, eternal life with God. But the thing that, that is so amazing about grace and God actually giving, you know, giving us our salvation, our, uh, our promise of eternity with him for, you know, for free is that we're not, uh, there's no selfish motive in what we're doing. People, people uh, get frustrated. They think it's not fair that, um, that God would uh, basically save somebody that, you know, like I always hear the, the, the you know, the Gandhi, the, the Gandhi trope where, oh, well, Gandhi's in hell, Gandhi's in hell. Well, it is actually much more fair because God is actually freeing you to um, approach something like it's not true altruism, but it, but in a way it, it you know, it, it's the closest we can get when we're doing uh, we're, we're, we're living in service to God when uh, we're actually walking out our faith, you know, really letting the Holy spirit lead us for, you know, you know, we could, you know, intentionally do good works, you know, basically to show appreciation for God. But um, the fact that we're not actually getting, uh, you know, the, the big prize, you know, which, you know, people consider life, that's whatever, you know, every Lordship or in pretty much every, uh, every other religion regards, you know, this, this promise of the afterlife as that that's the reward, but God says, no, that's the gift. That's the gift. And then after you have received that freely by faith, then you're actually free to, to work unselfishly out of gratitude for God, which, um, which does not cheapen uh, the finished work of Christ. It does not cheapen the promise of eternity because these are things that we do willingly. Um, we are promised some sort of reward in heaven. We don't really know exactly what those rewards look like, though. And I think in, in part, um, that's why God keeps it vague, because uh, we could get really carnal about it and try to, if we had an exact, you know, uh, uh, you know, I don't know, like a scorecard, like, well, so if I get this many points for good works, you know, uh, uh, you know, subsequent salvation, I'll get this Ferrari, you know, it's almost like a, like a point system uh, in what was it like, like all the cigarette clubs that used to have that, like if you submit enough points, you got this or that knickknack, but uh, God doesn't, uh, he doesn't give us those um, specificities, I think for a reason, but the, the point is, is that in any other point in our life, it's very, uh, even with our loved ones, um, or let's say our marriage, a lot of times when we're doing nice things, um, for the people we love, I think it, you know, it comes from the heart. Uh, that's why the, the, the dynamic of family is so important to understand with God. Um, he wants us to be, uh, you know, born again as, you know, as his children, which is one of the reasons why I really hate this, this uh, false, uh, you know, false Christianity, like this, this thing where they say, oh, we're all God's children. You know, these, these, uh, uh, just you know, watered down Christians that just hear that and they repeat that, and they 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 cheapen uh, so much about God's word that we understand we're we're not His children until we're born again, and that's when we actually get to benefit from that relationship, where um, where it's a family thing. It's not actually uh, like like I said before, an employer employee relationship where we're um, expecting you know X Y Z for services rendered, um, and when God can look at us and he knows that we're not actually submitting these, you know, we're not, whatever good we do uh, through him uh, is not, is not being done uh, selfishly in order to attain salvation in order to try to try to, you know, be good enough because if, if, if God actually allowed us to work for our salvation, we would, you know, we would never have a single thing that we did, uh, you know, in, you know, what, you know, in service to God that wasn't selfishly motivated. Um, and that would be, 
I mean, that would be a miserable, a miserable state to have to exist in for eternity, knowing that every good thing you did, you did in the interest of trying to trying to save your own butt. Um, so, yes, I do think it's uh, insulting to God when, we, when you know, we try to submit our filthy rags before him for, you know, this incredible gift that we can't even fathom, you know, makes your brain bend, even try to imagine what it's going to be like to spend eternity with God. But, uh, you know, aside from that, though, just, um, you know, once we're saved, absolutely not. For instance, you know, charity is one of the, you know, is identified as a, as a good work that we can do. And God loveth a cheerful giver. Uh, but see, there he goes back to the heart, right? He didn't say God loveth a giver. He said God loveth a cheerful giver because he, he sees your heart when you're doing it. He knows why you're doing it. And that's what really pleases God. Um, which is why he had to free us to do good works in gratitude rather than in in um, in our own self interest, uh, you know, it, as a, as a requirement for our salvation. Because he wants to see our heart, and that's really what all that matters. No matter what we do in life, you know, we're not going to please him if we're doing things in self interest. And um, uh, I think that's you know one of the things that uh, I, I used to hope. That God would be like if there was a God I I hope that he would see the heart and that's what would matter because you know we say the thought it's the thought that counts right and I was always a big oh it's the thought that counts person but you know it's really it's the heart that counts with God and um uh so yeah that that's why you know it to uh to cheapen this uh it would almost be like to to to, to for a child to try to earn their their parents love you know and and that's to us, you know, I mean, it seems like the most like appalling thing imaginable, but for parents to actually tell their children that they have to earn their love or even their, their, uh, you know, their status as children um, to their parents. Uh, and I think, you know, everything about the parent child relationship is an object lesson in salvation that God put here for us. And I do believe that's why he uh, would rather, you know, <laughs> uh, all of us uh, experience that at some point in our life so that we can understand. I think that's why, in general, you know, people feel like they're not complete unless they do have children, no matter what their worldview is, because um, until we do, it's it's uh, it's difficult to fathom, you know, that unconditional love, right? That's what they always tell us in the media and movies. Oh, they just wanted that unconditional love. And they, uh, they kind of distort that because they, 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 they set us up to, to think that, what we want is unconditional love so that once we're, once we hear that, well, there's a, there's a catch with God's love. You have to actually believe on Jesus to receive unconditional love from God. What, um, what they're not realizing is that's the only way to have that unconditional love because it's love that has nothing to do with our works. We're not trying to submit our works before him. It is now unconditional because we are in him as his children. And, um, that's what every lordshipper is trying to do. They're trying to put conditions back on that love by finding some way to, uh, to squeeze their works back in, which is really just an affront to God. And it, it underestimates and undercuts uh, the, uh, the magnitude of what Christ did for us. Um, it could never be something that we could compensate God for with our stupid, uh, our stupid works, our stupid services. So, okay. yes, I would say. Gotcha. All awesome. Right. Thank you. All right, Ben, will you go next? Uh, I already did. Really? Yep. Yes. Wow. I thought it was Renee and then Angel. How did I miss your answer, Ben? I, it was just so so well, good. I it went right over your head. I, I, think I, asked you, I think I asked you to go first on this one, didn't I? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. No, I, now I remember. Okay. Um, well, I'd say that, you know, obviously everybody carry, covered the bases very, very thoroughly on this question. Uh, I think that the proper distinction was made by all that um, if, if a person is doing the works uh, as a means of salvation, then it is an insult to God. Uh, so that is the key. Uh, what is the motivation? Is it to earn salvation? No, oh, it's a false gospel, and God's insulted by that. But uh, if it's uh, if it's uh, not for that reason, uh, then uh, then of course God would va would value our works. But really, it's 
or works are only valued if um, uh, we are a child. First of all, we have to be a child of God through faith. And then uh, I think our motivation is the determining factor. You do something in service for God and, and your fellow man, and God says, now that's wood, hay, and stubble. Well, why? Why would it be wood, hay, and stubble? I think it would be because uh, maybe your motivation was wrong. It was not pure enough. Something was off about your, the reason you did it. Um, so assuming the motivation is right, in this case, uh, they can't, the motivation cannot be for salvation. Uh, the verse that applies to this specifically is um, it's Romans uh, uh, 2. I mean, Romans, no, I'm sorry, Romans 4. Um, I'll read 4 and 5. It says, um, Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. So that means that if you think that uh, you're going to be getting eternal life from Jesus because of what you've done, then you're actually saying Jesus is in your debt. No, you, you don't get to make Jesus your debtor through your works. But in verse 5, it says, but to him that worketh not. Now, I used to interpret this as to him that worketh not means, well, you're saying that works are required for salvation, a lordship heretic? Well, if that's the case, how do you explain this verse? To him that worketh not means a person did not work at all. This person didn't do one work, much less all the work that you're requiring, you're imposing on everybody. He didn't even do one work. To the man, the work of not means zero works at all. So, uh, but his faith is counted as righteousness. Uh, but I do think that the really the correct way of understanding this verse is uh, we should uh, we should say that, and I bet it does uh, say this if we look at the Amplified. Maybe I will do that. It says now to, to him that worketh, uh, I'm sorry, but to him that worketh not for his salvation, but bringeth, but believeth on him that justify the ungodly, we could say for his salvation. His faith is counted as righteousness. So you can, for, for your salvation, you can believe, or for your salvation, you could work. But you better be someone who's not working for your salvation. That's really what this verse is saying. To the person who's not working for their salvation, but simply believes in, in Jesus for their salvation, then he is credited, his faith is credited as righteousness. Okay, let's see if anybody wants to say more about that. And I'll, I'm going to look at that in the envelope. I just have a curiosity now. Yeah, okay. the thing with works, and it's so ridiculous how we get accused, uh, is that we have to divide the Christian walk with what made us a Christian to begin with. And people think a Christian is living a pretty good life, a moral life until you die. Oh, and I believe in Jesus. But trusting Jesus is how we're saved. We're trusting his blood was shed on Calvary. It, that means all my sin, including future. I did not exist when Jesus died. It says that in the Old Testament, they had to keep offering the blood sacrifices. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sin forever sat down at the right hand of God. So it's done forever. His blood goes in both directions. And so does that mean because all my sins are covered, I sin more now? That doesn't even make sense. But because my sins were made for my blood, there is no sin that can condemn me. That's why I can't come into condemnation. I have already passed into eternal life. Eternal life is a possession we have now. That's why when we're absent from the body, we're present with the Lord. We have it now. It's not something you might get if you live good enough. That's why it can't be for him that works. That's why it says for him that works is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. Because then you're going to think God owes you something. And the only thing he owes you is the wages of your sin, which is death. But for him that worketh not, but believes. So we're believing that Christ's work did it. Not, not our works. It doesn't matter who you give credit to. 
uh, well, it's God doing it in me. Great. Okay. But it's still not about those works. It's about the work done on Calvary 2000 years ago. That's the gospel message. The only reason any of us are going to be saved in heaven with the Lord is because we received his blood sacrifice. That is it. That is all. And, uh, you know, our purpose is to be saved on two good works, to be a light to the world, to be a witness, a testimony, so that God in heaven is glorified. But none of that saves us. It's, just, it's so sad that most, we were talking, even after the first century, most of them started going away from the simplicity in Christ. The more I look into it, the sadder I get, but we see the warnings that that's going to happen. Grievous mm -hmm. wolf, not sparing the flock. Yep. That's why I really think he's talking about the early church fathers. Yep. Yeah. When I, I did the study on uh, early church history, and uh, Christian creeds and early church heresies and all those studies were very helpful, but it, it is I love a, those. It, it really amazed me uh, that um, immediately following the death of the apostles that heresy was brought in with the next generation of, of leaders, right in the, the very next generation beginning in the second century, they started think, bringing in things like uh, communion as a means, the Eucharist, the Roman Catholic concept that, that this is the means, and uh, uh, water baptism. Baptismal regeneration and the Eucharist, these two things were introduced right after the apostles, and that the, the heresy that, that uh, of course, your works and, and, and uh, your need for these uh, sacraments. Um, the I did look it up at the Amplified, uh, and it, I was correct that uh, they, they interpreted that verse the way that I would interpret it. It says, but to the one who does not work, that is, the one who does not try to earn his salvation by doing good, but believes and completely trusts in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited to him as righteousness, that is, right standing with God. So even though I like to use the verse to say, to the man that worketh not uh, means that this is a person who did zero work. Um, I think that 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 is a, a fact. It's true, but I don't think that was the intention of on that verse, though. All right. Um, okay, it's time for us to start. Uh, you know, summing up everything here. So um, let me ask if you're in the chat room and you have a, a point or a question or something that you want to squeeze in here in the end very quickly, put it in all caps and we'll try to get to it. Uh, otherwise, let's start with our uh, summaries. Uh, let's start with Brother Ben first. Would you uh, give us your uh, summary on the time tonight? Yes, I thought it was awesome. It was uh, uh, good to have Renee with us tonight. It was really cool. I expect Lisa to be back next week, um, but we, uh, we, we definitely had some great Great questions, great answers, great discussion, uh, very edifying, and um, looking forward to the to next Friday again. And uh, I, I do believe uh, Lisa is still planning on having a program on her channel tomorrow night. Okay, very good. All right, Sister Angel, what do you say? Uh, it's just been uh, it's been different because uh, we had such a, a small crew tonight, but it's been uh, it's been cool that we were able to uh, get through. I feel like we got through more questions than normal, so that was kind of fun. Um, and I also I wanted to say before we go, um, I'm gonna post on my community tab. I might be able to post it in the chat here too. There's a link to um, something that I find really useful uh, when it comes to time you're trying to contend with somebody about especially about eternal security, but the gospel in general, it's a list of, I believe, 63 things that would have to happen in order for man to lose his salvation. And it's, it's an incredible list where the person um, just basically lays out all the promises uh, Christ and God would have to break uh, that, you know, that are, you know, by quoting scripture um, in order uh, to, uh, to revoke our salvation. And, um, it's really something that it's like my go-to if somebody's trying to uh, uh, preach a false gospel, especially like in my comment section. Um, I, I just immediately, I, I post this list and I tell them, okay, look, you're going to have to explain at least like five of these things on this list. And then we can talk because they're so clear and it's quoting scripture in every, you know, in every, uh, you know, listed item. So 
Uh, and it's, you know, but they're going to have to explain a principle, like how would, how would Christ undo this? How would, you know, how would this not make God a liar? And um, it's just something I wanted uh, people to check out because I find it's just such a great tool. Plus it's also a really, really um, great way to just uh, to shore up your own foundation and, um, and, and, you know, reassure yourself if at times you're, you know, questioning or somebody has you, you know, uh, uh, feeling, you know, insecure about your understanding. This list is, is really ironclad. And um, uh, it, it'll also, it'll send those people, any, any trolls or people that are uh, trying to trouble you, it'll send them running because they won't be able to even get, I, I haven't ever had anybody even go through one. <laughs> one, maybe one, I think maybe one. But the point is that they can't even do like multiple, explain multiple um, promises Christ made in light of the idea that we could lose our salvation. Uh, so um, anyway, guys, check that out. I'm going to, I'm going to post the link in the chat if I get to you guys uh, before the chat closes out, but otherwise it will be on my community tab here shortly. I've posted it several times, but it's just, it's, it's worth it. Yeah, um, I would say. I'll lose it because I'm doing a editing a video right now on eternal security. I'll awesome. Yeah, I, good. Sorry. No, sorry. Sorry. Uh, I, did you ask me something, Renee? You're going to post it in the chat, right? Cause I yes. Love yes. Yes, I'm going to do that right now. I'm going to do that right now. I'm on my phone, so I'm going to mute real quick um, and uh, and go uh, retrieve it and post it in the chat. Beautiful. So, yeah, it's awesome. That, that's one thing I've discovered is that the Bible always goes out of its way, and I think there's certain statements in there that wouldn't make sense to, to be even said if it weren't specifically put in there uh, as a little nugget, essentially, to refute false doctrine. And as you go through it, you could you, you you could accumulate a list for any false doctrine. You'll come up with a list like fifty or hundred different arguments against it from scripture alone. And I just love how that's how scripture, uh, it, you know, scripture defines itself. It parameterizes itself. Um, and I just love how it's written. It, it, it's one of the great testaments that proves that it's inspired. Yeah. Anybody thinks you can lose salvation? I mean, it's obviously because they believe salvation is partly because of their works. Because if you if it was given to you as a free gift based on what Christ did, and he his precious blood was paid for all your sin, and then you're sealed by the Holy Spirit because you trusted in him, now you have eternal life right now. That life's eternal. Then how could you possibly lose it? Only if you think how you're living is maintaining your salvation, your own righteousness, living good enough. Because most people think you can lose it because you sinned. You backslid. So, okay, Christ didn't pay for those too. See, most people think you can lose it because they really are trusting themselves. They really are trusting their own righteousness. That's the only reason anybody, or and some people say, oh, well, you could lose faith. Well, that's not true either because they kept by the power of God through faith. So it, it's really sad. I, I'm looking forward to that list because uh, this video is going to take me a while to do, but I want to get a nice organized one. Uh, I'll go ahead, you guys. It was very nice to join you tonight. Uh, I, you guys are nice enough to send me an invitation weekly. It's, it's only because I, I have so many live streams during the week that I usually don't come, and you guys usually have a lot of people. Um, but I was very happy I was able to hang out with you guys. Really interesting questions. Um, you guys, pl please keep sending those in because it's interesting to think about these things, and it's a good time. I uh, really had a good time with everybody in chat. Uh, there was a couple of people that were new to the chat, uh, came over from the channel. I really appreciate that. We enjoyed having you. And uh, uh, Hendrix and a couple others were saying, you know, you people are really nice here. And I think that's important, especially in this climate of fear and in isolation, to have somewhere to go where you feel welcome and respected and people are kind to you. So uh, it was really nice to be here tonight. Thanks, Brother Luke and you guys, uh, Ben, Angel, for inviting me. All right. Thank you, sister. Uh, I greatly appreciate you, uh, you know, dropping everything to uh, come and help us tonight. And uh, it was a great pleasure uh, spending time with you again tonight. Uh, to the whole congregation, uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, this is Friday, so uh, tomorrow, Saturday, is the program that uh, Sister Lisa has. It's uh, I think it begins at 
8 p.m. Pacific, 11 p.m. Eastern time on her channel for the, uh, for the Most High Jesus. So don't forget to join her uh, tomorrow night. And then uh, join us Sunday, uh, 5 p.m. Eastern time on this same channel for our Sunday church service for the Church of the Eternally Secure. Uh, let's see, church, please see the comment section after the broadcast for Angel's List. That, that was referring to Angel's List of, I think it's 63 reasons uh, why eternal, eternal security is true. I'll post them after the program in the comment section. Oh, okay. Right, yes, I'm having. I, I didn't actually post the link when I when I posted in my community tab, so I just have the actual uh, list. So I, it's too long to post. So we'll just do it in the comments. But yes, it's 63 promises uh, Christ and God would have to break for man to lose their salvation. Awesome. Essentially, that's yeah. Awesome. Thank you for that. All right, then. So to the whole congregation, thanks again for being with us tonight. Look forward to seeing you next time. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus.